Well, Crofty, it seems that last episode, we might have been tempting fate a little bit by complaining about the heat in the UK at the time. <laughs> we should have learnt not to do that, having lived here for, you know, three decades each. Yeah, because having having gone through what I think we complained about at the time was high 20s, low 30s sort of temperature. Two weeks later, we got high 30s, low 40s, which is pretty unprecedented in the UK. And uh, that's one of the reasons why it's taken us a little bit longer than we expected to get round to recording part two of this podcast. Yeah, we kind of melted and had to wait to sort of reconstitute ourselves. Uh, one thing to point out for any international listeners who live in areas where that sort of temperature is the norm, the UK doesn't have air conditioning in houses as standard. It's just like not a thing over here. So, you know, we all live in houses that are designed to retain as much heat as possible in winter. And I don't know about you, Croft, but I can't really function in temperatures over like 25 degrees anyway. I can't sleep. I can't really work. And I managed to keep the temperature in my house down to a nice low 33 <laughs> yeah my, mine was at least a bit a bit better than that because i don't live in a house that's designed to retain heat in winter mm. but anyway hello folks welcome to mythological the show which covers all things mythology and folklore i am charles and i'm uh, joined today by my pet sasquatch uh, assistant crofty I'm worried whether this means you think I am actually a Sasquatch or not. <laughs> well, if you were to get an independent group of scientists in front of us, they would point to me and say, well, he's the hairier one, so he must be the Sasquatch. That's true. That's true. Mm. Four minutes in and we've got a bold joke already. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but on the topic of being four minutes in, I think we should get cracking. So this episode is part two of our Bigfoot episode. And I think, Crofty, we can just get right back on into it. Yes, let's go. Yep, so the one thing for me to just quickly mention before we get going today again is the sources. So for this episode, I used several sources from Bigfoot Skeptics. These included the work Abominable Science, Origins of the Yeti, Nessie, and Other Famous Cryptids by Daniel Lockston and Donald R. Profiro specifically Chapter 2, which was concerning Bigfoot. I also used the work Bigfoot Exposed, An Anthropologist Examines America's Enduring Legend by Dr. David J. Daigling. I used the work Bigfoot, The Life and Times of a Legend by Joshua Blue Burrs. And for some additional information for this episode, I also used the work Anatomy of a Beast by Michael McLeod. Now, just to make sure that we were being relatively fair, about what resources we used. I also used some elements from a number of works by Bigfoot advocates and believers. These included the works Bigfoot by Lauren Coleman, who in the previous part we mistakenly referred to as a woman. Lauren Coleman is actually a man, so apologies for that mistake. I also used some elements from the work Sasquatch Legend Meets Science by Jeff Meldrum and from the work Big Footprints, A Scientific Inquiry into the Reality of Sasquatch by Grover Krantz, and his updated work Bigfoot Sasquatch Evidence. Finally, I also used a couple of articles, which were Mayak Datat, Hairy Man Pictographs, from the journal The Relicit Hominoid Inquiry, which, for the sake of transparency, I should say, is a pro-Bigfoot journal that is edited by Bigfoot researcher Jeff Meldrum. And the article, Mayak Datat, an archaeological viewpoint of the hairy man pictographs from the Bigfoot Information Project website. Both of these were by Kathy Moskowitz Strain. And in addition to these, I also used a variety of other sources here and there that I will do my best to mention as I go. So as well as the books that Charles has just mentioned, I also use Roger Patterson's book, do abominable snowmen of America really exist? In addition, I get some information from the 2004 Skeptical Inquirer article exposing Roger Patterson's 1967 Bigfoot film hoax by Cal Korf and Michaela Kosis, from Jeff Meldrum's scientific journal The Relict Hominoid Inquiry, 
I use the paper DNA as evidence for the existence of relic hominoids by Haskell v. Hart. And also through that, I reference Melba Ketchum's paper, Novel North American Hominins, Next Generation Sequencing of Three Whole Genomes and Associated Studies, and two papers discussing these findings. One was simply titled Review of Novel North American Hominins, Next Generation Sequencing of Three Whole Genomes and Associated Studies by Ellen Tarr, and one titled The Ketchum Project, What to Believe About Bigfoot DNA Science by Sharon Hill. Before we pick up again, Crofty, with where we left off at the end of part one, I do want to just quickly mention two topics that were kind of left over from part one, both relate to our discussion of Native American mythology and folklore that various Bigfoot advocates have attempted to relate to the more modern idea of the Sasquatch. So the first thing to address is something of a small correction from uh, a thing that I said in part one, which is, I believe I inadvertently said that the Cherokee uh, belong to the Algonquian-speaking peoples. This is incorrect. The Cherokee are part of the Iroquois language family, so apologies for that mistake. However, the broader point I believe I was making in that section about the Algonquian-speaking peoples having various creatures within their wider myths that could be treated in something of a dual fashion, both as a menace if treated improperly and as a potential boon if treated properly. That point, to the best of my knowledge, was correct. Secondly, I want to take some time before we get back to our more modern discussion of Bigfoot to discuss what turned out to be quite a big omission from my section in part one, uh, which is what is often referred to as the Hairy Man pictographs, which were found at Painted Rock on the Chul River Indian Reservation in Southern California. So these consist of a large number of figures that have been painted on the ceilings and walls of a rock shelter that was found next to the Chul River. This appears to have been associated with a prehistoric Native American village. Now, these pictographs were mostly painted using substances such as red ochre, what is described as a yellow form of ochreous clay, an unknown white substance, and what was speculated by the original ethnographers who found the site to be a mixture of clay and powdered charcoal, which produced a black colour. On a wider basis, these pictures include depictions of people, animals such as beavers, coyotes, bears, frogs, caterpillars, eagles and lizards, and a variety of geometrical shapes. However, by far the most interest amongst Bigfoot enthusiasts has been on three large painted figures, the most elaborate of which is thought to depict a creature known as the Mayak Datat, also known as the Sun Sunut, but that is more commonly referred to as the Hairy Man. This painting consists of a 2.6 metre tall humanoid figure, it stood with its arms outspread, covered in what is purported to be long hair, and that also possesses large, elaborate eyes with lines that run down from them to its chest. In addition to this image, the same wall also includes images of two smaller, less elaborate figures that stand 1.8 metres and 1.2 metres tall, and that have been identified by Bigfoot advocates as a female and a child, respectively. Exactly when these images were created is somewhat uncertain. I managed to find two estimates for datings for them, but they both quite significantly disagree with each other. So the first comes from a Dr. W.J. Hoffman, who visited the site in 1882, prior to their first written reporting, which I will get into shortly. At the time, he gave the following age estimate as part of his description of the site. And I have the quote here from him. The country is at present occupied by several tribes of the Mariposan linguistic stock, and the only answer made to inquiries respecting the age or origin of the painting was that it was found there when the ancestors of the present tribes arrived. 
The local migrations of the various Indian tribes of this part of California are not yet known with sufficient certainty to determine to whom the records may be credited, but all appearances with respect to the weathering and disintegration of the rock upon which the record is engraved, the appearance of the colouring matter subsequently applied, and the condition of the small depressions made at the time for mixing the pigments with a viscous substance indicate that the work was performed about a century ago. So, late 18th century. However, according to C. William Clulo, writing in 1978 as part of Volume 8 of the Handbook of North American Indians, which I again managed to find a copy of on archive.org, these paintings are estimated as part of the South Sierra type of pictographs to have been made anywhere between the years 1 AD through to 1600, though he provides no specific argument here for why this particular date was selected. I'm assuming because that's a general dating that that style of pictographs has been assigned. But again, pretty huge time span there as estimates go. So I originally left out these pictographs from my discussion of uh, Native American stories associated with Bigfoot in part one for a couple of reasons. The first was just that my script was already getting ridiculously long at that point, and at the time I couldn't find that much information out about them. Since then, however, I have come across a number of articles on these pictographs by the anthropologist Kathy Moskovitz Strain that I mentioned in my sources, and through her work I was able to locate the original reports of these pictographs that were published between the late 1880s through to the 1940s. And as I had these at my disposal, I thought it was best that we now devote some time to their discussion. I want to preface all of what I'm about to say by saying that, to the best of my knowledge, Kathy Moskowitz Strain is very much a Bigfoot true believer, and she does confidently refer to the pictograph figures as either Bigfoot or the Bigfoot family throughout the various articles she has written on the topic. Uh, for various pro-Bigfoot books and websites. So I'm not trying to poison the well here when it comes to judging the veracity of the claims she makes, but I thought for the sake of transparency I should mention this. So the earliest written description of these images I was able to find dates from 1889, and it appears as part of a report made by the ethnographer Garrick Mallory, titled Picture Writing of the American Indians, which was part of a larger report made by the Bureau of Ethnology to the Secretary of the Smithsonian. In his report, he specifically describes the largest of these figures as a person weeping, referring to the lines running down the figure's breast, from which he concluded that sorrow was the main intended betrayal. He also concluded that the posture of the figure was an exact match for the gesture of rain. In this report, he also identified the two other figures, but he specifically referred to them as humans in what he termed various shapes making gestures for negation, or more specifically, nothing, nothing here. Now, in one of Kathy's articles, specifically the one that she wrote for the Bigfoot Information Project, she claims that in his report, he wrote that the local Yokut Native Americans called the largest of these creatures Hairy Man. However, on reading his original report, I found no evidence for this claim. I got a copy of this report from Gutenberg.org, by the way. Now, to be fair to Kathy, I think this is just a mistake. I don't think this is an intentional attempt to mislead the reader, as in all of her later articles, she doesn't include this claim and instead relates the first uh, mention of the hairy man name to a much later report. So, moving on from Garrick Mallory, these figures were also discussed in 1929 by Julian H. Stewart as part of a wider report on Californian Native American pictographs, and in 1949 by Frank F. Latter as part of his Handbook of Yokuts Indians, I was able to find a copy of the first from the UC Berkeley website, and it essentially just repeats what Mallory reported in 1889. I was not able to track down a copy of Frank Latter's handbook, 
either online or in the form of a secondhand copy at a price that I could afford and that would arrive at a reasonable time. So when it comes to his work, I am taking Kathy's word as to its content. So according to her latter, it says, quote, the Indians readily recognize the characters which represent animals, but they offer no other explanation for the geometrical designs and line drawings other than to give the Indian name for circle, triangle, square, or other common figures. They do identify drawings of a few mythological characters. So it is not until 1975 that there is any record of these figures being associated with the more modern figure of Bigfoot or being referred to under the Hairy Man name. For context and to refresh things a little bit from part one, this puts this connection after the popularization of both the Bluff Creek footprints and another more famous Bigfoot encounter that Crofty is going to discuss shortly. This connection is made in the work Bigfoot and Other Stories by Elizabeth Bayless Johnston, which again I could not find an independent copy of anywhere online or available in hard copy, so I have not been able to verify this and I'm going entirely from Kathy's article. Her article quotes Johnston as saying that in 1973 she began gathering some of the traditional stories of the local Chul River Indians by their own request. During this process, the daughter of a tribal elder who was the caretaker of the Pitchcraft site in the early 1990s identified the Pitchcraft figure of the hairy man as being identical to Bigfoot. Alongside this, Johnston further noted that the hairy man was described by the Chul River Indians as a creature that was like a great big giant with long shaggy hair. Interestingly, a figure matching this description is not found throughout the wider mythology of the Yokuts, which is the ethnographic group to which the Chul River peoples belong. So this mythology has been chronicled since the 1930s by figures such as Anna Gayton, Alfred Krober, Stanley Newman, and the previously mentioned Frank Latter. There is, however, one possible exception to this, and that is the story of the giant of Ah Wa Wi, which was recorded by Frank Latter in his 1936 work Californian Indian Folklore. This story describes a large, hairy giant known as Ul El M, who preys upon the bird and animal people of the Yosemite Valley. Specifically, this creature is described as having big feet, as having an impenetrable hide, so similar to the stone clad that we discussed in part one, and as being able to abduct grown people who he would carry away to a secret hiding place and turn into jerky. In this story, in desperation to be rid of him, the people of the valley ask the fly Uchum to bite the giant all over his body and discover where he can be hurt. After the giant lies down, the fly discovers that he could be injured only on his feet, so the people set up sharp splinters of bone in the ground where they know he will walk. The giant then stands on the bone splinters, which cut his heels, and he dies, after which the animal peoples burn his body. It is further said that at the time of his death, the giant had lots of jerky on the rock near his hiding place, at the Cascade Falls, and that as no bird or animal people would go near the place, the jerky is still hanging there to this day. So with the possible exception of this story, the first narratives that actually explicitly include the hairy man, as reported by the Chul River people, were not actually collected until the early 1990s, and they were collected by Kathy Moscovitz Strain herself. According to Kathy's articles, the main storytellers that she received them from were the tribal elders Isidore Garfield, Leona Danby and J.R. Manuel, along with what is described as others in attendance. So I've chosen one of these stories to recount here today, specifically because it claims to have an origin story for the painted rock pictographs. And this story is called How People Were Made. All the birds and animals of the mountains went to Hoshu to make people. 
Eagle, chief of all the animals, asked each animal how they wanted people to be. Each animal took a turn and said what they had to say. Fish said, people should know how to swim, like me, so let them be able to hold their breath and swim very deep. Hummingbird said, people should be fast, like me, so let them have good feet and endurance. Eagle said, people should be wiser, wiser than me, so people will help animals and take care of the earth. Turtle said, people should be able to protect themselves, like me, so let's give them courage and strength. Lizard said, people should have fingers, like me, so that people can make baskets, bows and arrows. Owl said, people should be good hunters, like me, so give them knowledge and cunning. Condor said, people should be different from us, so give them hair, not feathers or furs, to keep them warm. Then Coyote said, people should be just like me, because I am smart and tricky, so have them walk on all fours. Hairy Man, who had not said anything yet, shook his head and said, no, people should walk on two legs like me. All the other animals agreed with Hairy Man, and Coyote became very angry. He challenged Hairy Man to a race, and they agreed whoever won could decide how people should walk. They gathered at the waterfall below Hochu to begin the race. Coyote started and took a shortcut. Hairy Man was wiser than Coyote, and knew that Coyote would cheat to win, and people would have to walk on all fours. So Hairy Man stayed behind and helped Eagle, Condor, and the others make people. They went back to the rock and drew people on two legs on the ground. The animals breathed on them, and people came out of the ground. Hairy Man was very pleased and went to people, but when they saw Hairy Man, they were scared and ran away. That made Hairy Man sad. When Coyote came back and saw what they had done, he was very angry and drew himself on the rock, eating the moon. All the other animals drew their pictures on the rock as well, so people would remember them. Hairy Man was sad because people were afraid of him, so he drew himself sad. That is why Hairy Man's picture is crying to this day. That is how people were made. So, for me, there are several big problems with associating these pictograph figures with the modern figure of Bigfoot, and indeed with the later stories gathered by Kathy. Assuming that Clulo's dating is accurate, which is a fairly big assumption, these figures were likely made a long time ago by peoples with an oral culture. So, obviously, we lack anything in the way of historical documentation of what these figures would have represented at the time they were made. Given the potentially large span of time since their creation to their recording, it also seems reasonable to me to think that the meaning associated with these figures by peoples local to the region may well have changed over the centuries. Probably the most problematic fact for me, however, is that, as we've discussed, we lack any examples of stories associated with the hairy man figures amongst the local Yokuts, uh, Native Americans, that predate Bigfoot becoming widely known as a figure throughout America. As we discussed, the earliest recorded equation between these two figures doesn't appear until the mid-1970s, and the earliest recorded stories featuring the hairy man figure apparently weren't recorded until the early 1990s. As such, we're placed in the difficult position of being unable to judge just how much the publicity surrounding Bigfoot may have influenced these stories, in my mind. Personally, I'm not convinced that these pictographs are anything more than an example of a very old and very interesting set of drawings that later Bigfoot advocates have attempted to associate with the Sasquatch. However, the one thing I will say is that, as we saw in part one, there are many varied reports of wild men or hairy giants that were found elsewhere in Native American folklore. So I would not be surprised if the stories given to us by the Chul River people are in fact much older, are in fact much older than the recency of their recording might indicate. It's mostly just their association with a modern idea of Bigfoot that I am questioning here. Okay, Crofty, so I think that's a reasonable discussion of those particular images. And as such, I think we can probably crack on 
and get back to discussing some of the more modern evidence that has been proposed for Bigfoot. And before then, I think you're going to start us off with just a quick summary of where we got up to at the end of part one. Yes, thank you, Charles. I'll be picking up roughly where we left off at the end of last episode. I say we'll give a brief summary of last time. As you just said, Charles, we started from the earliest Native American stories of wild men or ape men or hairy giants, which matched some of Bigfoot's description and went from there all the way to the media sensation that led to the coining of the name Bigfoot, which was the 1958 Bluff Creek footprints. In that time, we also saw Bigfoot slowly making their way into the popular consciousness through kidnapping events in British Columbia, the battle at what would later be named Ape Canyon in Washington, and even attempts to publicise a Sasquatch hunt. The truth of these stories, and the validity of the footprints as physical evidence, had been debated back and forth in the newspapers and among cryptozoology enthusiasts quite some time. Round about this time, a few anthropologists were beginning attempts to give some scientific credibility to the search for Bigfoot, while arguably the antics of Ray Wallace, who ran the site where the Bluff Creek footprints were discovered, were seriously straining that credibility. And it is in this climate where the most famous event in the history of Bigfoot would occur, the recording of the film by Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin. So I want to just quickly preface Crofty's comments here by apologising in advance when we inevitably get Roger Patterson's name mixed up with the name Robert Pattinson, which you might not have realised because I edited around it a bit in part one, but whenever I had to say Roger Patterson, I, I think I managed to say Robert Pattinson on multiple occasions. Yes, Robert Pattinson is the Batman. Yes. <laughs> which I still haven't seen, so no, no, no spoilers, please. <laughs> I've not seen it either. Oh, so, okay, yeah. we're, we're <laughs> really damaging our nerd cred here today. <laughs> yeah, true. But we're not here to discuss Batman, fortunately. Otherwise, it would be a very short podcast. <laughs> so I will start with a brief bit of details on who Roger Patterson was and Bob Giblin. Although, in terms of their early lives, there is, from what I can gather, quite little information on specific specifics of their early lives. What I have read about Roger Patterson does paint an interesting picture. In Abominable Science, Loxton and Prothero describe him as a highly artistic, small-town hustler with dreams of the big score, a stage acrobat, carny, inventor, illustrator, Bigfoot sculptor, self-published Bigfoot author, and semi-pro rodeo rider, which, if nothing else, makes him someone I would definitely enjoy getting a beer with and listening to his stories. Mm. You know, whether I believe a word of them, that's a different matter, but it would be an, enjoy an enjoyable conversation. As well as this, he was also an amateur filmmaker, and he had made, his, made attempts to pitch his ideas to studios in Hollywood. And he did, in fact, spend several years on the search for Bigfoot prior to the, the film and in 1966 published a book, Do Abominable Snowmen of America Really Exist?, which contains probably the most comprehensive collection of newspaper articles on Bigfoot sightings at the time, which started with the 1958 Humboldt Times article that we discussed last time, and covered several years of reported sightings in the small towns of Northern California, before going back to the events in Washington and British Columbia. Bob Gimlin, who was a cowboy, a hunter, a tracker, and also a rodeo rider, had been friends with Patterson for several years, and the 1967 expedition in which the film was made was at least the second trip where Patterson had enlisted Gimlin's help. So, yeah, so according to Greg Long's book, The Making of Bigfoot, which was a collection of interviews with uh, friends and family members of Roger Patterson, uh, I think specifically because uh, Bob Gimlin had some Native American ancestry, he was recruited to play an Indian in some of Patterson's uh, early attempts to make a film associated with Bigfoot. That is correct. And then he was recruited for one film in particular that will be coming up, in, coming up in a bit. Mm -hmm. 
So, of the two of them, Gimlin seems to have had less enthusiasm for finding Bigfoot prior to the film. Jeff Meldrum actually quotes Gimlin describing his initial scepticism when Patterson first showed him Bigfoot footprints. He says, I was not convinced that they really existed. You know, I figured Roger must have had a reason. He showed me plaster casts, and I heard different stories from people who had seen them. So I thought, maybe there's something to this, but I just didn't believe in them, basically. I didn't believe it was possible that they could exist. And after the film's release it itself, while well, Patterson began appearing in the media almost immediately after the film's release, Gimlin would avoid the public eye as much as possible for nearly 40 years before starting to make appearances at conventions and on shows such as Finding Bigfoot in roughly the mid-2000s. Yeah, I think according to Mike McQueard's book, he made all of three public appearances before the mid-2000s. Yeah, that sounds about right. I've, I think I saw that one myself, yeah. So, Patterson's interest in Bigfoot was first sparked in 1959, when he read the True Magazine article, The Strange Story of America's Abominable Snowman, by Ivan T. Sanderson, which he reprints in the first chapter of his book. The article mostly retold the events in Bluff Creek in 1958 and dismissed all allegations of a hoax without giving any real justification for that. Patterson described Sanderson as a leading research scientist of very high calibre writing in a leading men's magazine. Although Sanderson, after looking him up myself, only had a BA in zoology and an MA in botany, and his scientific research career seems to have been very limited. And most of his work was as a nature writer for a popular audience. And by the 1950s, he had almost entirely shifted to writing on paranormal subjects, including cryptids and UFOs. So it was Sanderson's article that inspired Patterson to take his first trip to Humboldt County. There, he talked with locals, including a few writers for the Humboldt Times, to Jerry Crew, who we discussed last time, who reported the initial footprints, and assorted other locals in the town. And he claimed that the county had roughly a 50-50 split between believers and non-believers, and said that whether the locals were believed in Bigfoot or didn't was mainly determined by whether or not a person had investigated Bigfoot tracks themselves. Whilst he was there, he spent a few days travelling up Bluff Creek with a couple of the locals, and claimed that there were still Bigfoot tracks being found regularly in the area, and that he even saw some himself, which was a factor that cemented his belief that Bigfoot was real. He also claimed one night while camping there to have heard a strange high-pitched whine that trailed off into a low growl in the night, which he attributed to a Bigfoot. So after spending a few years researching other Bigfoot encounters, in 1966, Patterson would begin to make expeditions to another famous Bigfoot encounter site, the region near Mount St. Helens and Spirit Lake, which by then was known as Ape Canyon. His first expedition to Ape Canyon turned up nothing, until on his way back he stopped at his friend Charlie Arian's nearby ranch, where Arian showed him several days worth of 18-inch long tracks in one of his fields, which Patterson took plaster casts of. A second expedition was similarly unproductive, and for his third trip, Patterson then recruited his friend Bob Gimlin, who was an experienced tracker, and who said at the time he would be delighted to try his hand at helping us track these giants. The trip was once again uneventful. While Gimlin was able to identify signs that a large creature had previously followed the trail they took, there were no tracks or evidence of a Bigfoot to be found. Patterson did make a few other uneventful expeditions that year, and it wasn't until 1967 that he finally found what he was looking for. I give this background here because I do feel it's important to make it clear that the 1967 trip was far from Patterson's first attempt to find Bigfoot. So, in Abominable Science, Loxton and Prothero say, the basic circumstances of the filming strain credibility. Patterson, a Bigfoot author, set out on a camping trip to film Bigfoot, and then he promptly did. And while it is correct that this is the first time, as far as I can tell, that there was any record of Patterson taking camera equipment 
on a trip to find Bigfoot. The circumstances do often get misrepresented as Patterson being successful on his first attempt to find Bigfoot. Yeah, I think some accounts even literally say he found it on the first day when he was out there, I think for nearly a week by all accounts before he struck gold, so to speak. Yeah, that's it. It does seem to misrepresent his look a bit to sort of say this must be fake because he had it that easy while no one else has had similar luck. And so while it is probably a bit much of a coincidence that his first and only sighting was also the first time he brought a camera along, it is only fair to say here that he had been putting in the legwork for quite a long time before then. So I'll give him credit where it's due on that. Yeah, I mean, there's accounts from Greg Long's book of him like annoying his co-workers with discussions of Bigfoot and Bigfoot, Bigfoot expeditions and making home movies for like a, a good decade before he actually uh, went out on any expeditions as well. That's it. It really had become his life by this point, from what I can gather. Mm. So the trip itself came about when Patterson was beginning work on a docudrama film, which was based on the account of Fred Beck whom he had interviewed for his book. Fred Beck, to remind anyone who's forgotten from last time, was the man who gave the most detailed account of the Battle of Ape Canyon. So the film, based on that, was about a group of miners being led by a wise old Indian tracker on the hunt for Bigfoot. So initially, they had been working in Yakima in Washington, which was where Patterson was living at the time, and Patterson had enlisted Gimlin, who was partly of Apache descent, to play the Indian tracker after a chance meeting at the gas station. Patterson's friend Bob Hieronymus was also part of the planned cast. Keep that name in the back of your mind, it will come up later, and it will be important. So, in the early stages of the project, Patterson then heard of more tracks appearing at Bluff Creek, and so he decided to pack up and move production down to California in order to get footage of these tracks. After arriving in Humboldt County, the group rode out into the forest on horseback, away from the region where the logging work was being done, and began hunting for tracks. After a few days, on Friday, October the 20th, Patterson and Gimlin were riding northeast up the east bank of Bluff Creek in about the early afternoon. So, to quote Gimlin, as reprinted in Joshua Blue Burrs' book, we rounded this bend in the creek bed. There was a fallen tree, and as we came around it, there was this creature standing by the creek. That's when everything started happening. The horses started jumping around, raising the devil and spooking from this creature. Roger, while his horse was rearing up and jumping around, and he slid off him. Patterson gives a slightly different account, and he claims that instead the horses were already skittish as they entered the canyon, and that his horse actually fell as the pair sighted the Bigfoot. Patterson described what he saw as the horse raised itself and he grabbed the reins, and he says, This creature was on my left, about 125 feet across the creek. Its head very human, though considerably more slanted, and with a large forehead and wide, broad nostrils. Its arms hung almost to its knees when it walked. Its hair was two to four inches long, brown underneath, lighter at the top, and covering the entire body, except for the face around the nose, mouth, and cheek. And it was female. It had big, pendulous breasts. So, Patterson hurriedly grabbed the camera and started filming, running towards the creature. So, for those who might not have seen the footage, which I doubt there's many of you if you're, you know, four hours into listening to us talk about about Bigfoot, but for anyone who might not have seen it, the footage is 59 seconds long. The Bigfoot emerges from the trees to the left of the shot, walks from left to right. As Patterson approaches, he stumbles and falls, and rights himself and stabilizes the camera in time to catch the Bigfoot turn and look at the pair. The Bigfoot doesn't break stride as she does so. She carries on walking at the same steady pace through the clearing and behind a patch of trees and carries on further up the canyon. Patterson moves around to get one last shot of the creature from behind as it walks away before running out of film. So, in a 2011 interview on Animal Planet's Finding Bigfoot, Bob Gimlin would describe the experience. He says, She was just across the creek. When I first saw her, she was standing upright, and I thought, this is unreal, the way it was moving, the mass of muscle. 
Roger had the camera up to his eyes and he stumbled and fell. You can see the shaky part there. I rode across the creek, got off the horse and took my rifle out of the scabbard in case I had to make a shot. She made that turn to look, kept right on walking. She went on up out of sight up that canyon. And all this time I'm thinking, holy mackerel, these things do exist. It sounds much better in his, like, you know, American accent than my Yorkshire one. Mm. <laughs> so Patterson would give two different descriptions of the moment that the Bigfoot actually turned and looked at him. The first one that he gave to the Los Angeles Times said that Bigfoot seemed curious, like it wondered what was making that noise, but didn't seem real startled, like it had seen people before, like we weren't anything special. The second description, which was given to John Green for his book, said the creature was wary and it looked at him how it is when the umpire tells you one more word and you're out of the game. That's the way it felt. So yeah, those are two quite different descriptions. One very threatening and one very much not. <laughs> so I'm not sure really which to believe. Yeah, that's kind of a, one of the slight problems with the Patterson Gimlin film is where you know you do occasionally get discrepancies between it's two own it's like it's only two participants accounts yeah that's it and there are changes in the story over time unfortunately so it's a bit difficult to really pick out the truth of it after running out of film patterson would hurriedly try and change the film to start filming again while gimlin started to make his way up the canyon to attempt to follow the creature but Gimlin couldn't regain sight of it before Patterson called him back, as he didn't want Gimlin leaving him alone and unarmed for fear that there were more nearby. Changing the film took quite some time, and by the time the two were back on the horses, in order to follow Bigfoot, they couldn't pick up the trail. They returned to the film site in order to make plaster casts of the tracks they had left behind, which were 14 and a half inches long, and so deep that Gimlin could only make similar impressions by jumping from a fallen tree. After this, they packed up and they returned to the nearby town of Eureka, and they spoke to a reporter for the Humboldt Times Standard, which was now a single paper, successor to the Times and Standard, that were in print in 58. Patterson contacted the anthropologists John Green and Don Abbott, as well as fellow Bigfoot hunter René de Hinden, and his funder, Al Diatle. The group convened back in Yakima to screen the film, and to discuss screening it for scientists, at Green and De Hinden's insistence, before selling it to the highest bidder, in order to satisfy Diatle as the investor. At the same time, the front page of the Humboldt Times Standard reported that Mrs. Bigfoot is filmed. However, Andrew Genzoli, who wrote the article about the original Bluff Creek Footprints, was claiming at the time that the film was a fake, and stating that the creature that he popularised now belongs to the strange realm of fantasy and fiction. Less than a week later, Patterson began screening the footage, beginning with three screenings on Thursday, October the 26th, in British Columbia. Two of these were at the University of British Columbia, one for a small group of scientists, followed by one for the general public. There was then a screening for journalists held at the Georgia Hotel, as the University of British Columbia didn't want the press present at the first two. These screenings failed to spark much in interest. None of the scientists who were present were willing to get involved with any further research into the creature. And following this, the credibility of the film did unravel surprisingly quickly. So... A naturalist of the British Columbia Provincial Museum, Frank Beebe, wrote a report the following week in which he described the creature in the film as impressive unless you understood biology, in which case it started to look like an impossibility. He pointed out traits including what he described as a male gait and pointed out the mismatch between head shape and belly shape. He explained that the head shape with the large crest supporting powerful jaw muscles, implied diet that was very high in leaves and vegetables, so high fibre, low calorie, and requiring very extensive chewing in order to break down. But to digest this kind of diet, Bibi said that the creature would need a protuberant belly in order to allow space for long intestines. And it was this kind of contradiction 
that led BB to conclude that the creature was a fake. You might go into this shortly, Crofty, but I also believe I also believe there is no example of any other species of primate that has the combination of the male, I think it's called a sagittal crest, with female characteristics such as breasts. It's usually exclusively male characteristic in primates. Yeah, I think I think it was John Napier who said said that there was definitely a mismatch between between certain male regions and certain female regions in primates. But I don't I don't think I have that exact specific that you've just said. So yeah, thank okay. you for adding that there. Hey folks, it's Charles here in post. Just a quick correction. I looked into this just to make sure if it was right or not, and it turns out I believe that some female gorillas can have this crest. The sources I found online basically said that this is quite rare, but it is possible. So if that's the case, apologies, we got that wrong. Okay, back to the show. So there were also a group of scientists from the American Museum of Natural History who would give similar reports um, from that screening and conclu also concluded that the film was fake for basically the same reasons. As Patterson was screening the film and the scientists were writing their reports, Bob Titmus, the tracker who helped cast the original Bluff Creek footprints, was inspecting the site where the film was made and attempted to reconstruct the Sasquatch's path based on the tracks that he found despite the fact that Gimlin had claimed that heavy rain had washed away the footprints the day after filming. So, Titmus' description of the path of the creature did not match Patterson and Gimlin's description of the film itself. So, John Green and a local from Humboldt County, a man named Jim McLaren, inspected the site as well, and they attempted to do a reconstruction of the film, with McLaren taking the place of Bigfoot. McLaren was six foot five or 195 centimeters tall, and he attempted to recreate the path, although imperfectly and from memory, which Green would then use to use McLaren's height to calibrate Patterson's film. So, initially, from this, Green concluded that the Bigfoot was just under seven feet tall. However, a few years later, he would revise that down to being shorter than McLaren. So quite a distance away from the often regularly claimed height of eight feet that uh, a lot of big, Bigfoot researchers have kind of gravitated to over the years. Exactly. And the fact that he would revise it later on is a bit, a little bit iffy. Yeah, I assume, I think we're probably going to get into as well. There are all sorts of problems around establishing a lot of basic details around the film, like the distance that Patterson was away from the subject, the frame rate, yeah, all sorts of things like that. That's it. Certain people conclude, like depending on what f what frame rate was used, would be the determinant of whether it's real or fake. And there's not mm. that information is just not available. So yeah, there's quite a few things like that where people have to make certain assumptions before giving a conclusion, which makes it very difficult to say one way or the other, whether it's real or fake. So after those few weeks and attempts to gain credibility from academics beginning to fail, Patterson, Gimlin and Diatle would then shift their focus to commercializing the film. They incorporated a production company, naming it Bigfoot Enterprises in Hollywood and began planning a feature length film while Patterson would begin appearing on talk shows. But this didn't really gain any additional credibility for the film. It was then, though, that the man who had inspired Patterson in the first place, Ivan Sanderson, began to take an interest. He would secure a deal with the magazine Argosy to buy a copy of the film and the rights to publish images from it. It was this deal that would cause a major boom in the popularity of Bigfoot, with the February 1968 edition of Argosy containing Sanderson's first Bigfoot article, selling over a million copies in its first week, and inspiring 6,000 letters to Sanderson in response, with the magazine receiving similarly high numbers. Argosy would publish another article by Sanderson in April, with tabloid newspapers and several other magazines, including Reader's Digest, National Wildlife, and Atlantic Monthly, 
publishing regular articles for the next decade. Between 1969 and 1981, tabloids had printed 106 articles on Bigfoot. A similar number was estimated for men's magazines, and more than 30 books on Bigfoot were published. And so Bigfoot was now firmly embedded in the popular consciousness, with Sanderson in control of the rights to everything related to the film. But even with the commercial power of Sanderson behind it, scientific credibility still remained almost non-existent. Sanderson, quite early on, handpicked a group of scientists who he expected to be supportive of the film, the most famous of whom in Bigfoot circles was John Napier, who is a Bigfoot advocate and was, was a professor of primatology at the Smithsonian. I think I would argue that Napier was more Bigfoot adjacent rather than a Bigfoot advocate in that it- it's a lot of his work, in a lot of his work, he was kind of open to the idea, but I don't think he ever conclusively stated he thought the creature existed. Yeah, so I, I didn't mean to say Bigfoot advocate. So I should say just, he was the most famous among among Bigfoot enthusiasts, and is known for being quite open minded on the subject. I should say, just to clarify, Sanderson convened this group of scientists, including Napier, at the Smithsonian to view the film. Some of these scientists would outright reject the film as a fake, and Napier himself, despite being quite open-minded, found quite a few flaws. So, just to correct my response to you earlier, Charles, it wasn't the male-female discrepancy that I was thinking of that you mentioned. Um, The issue that Napier found was that the upper half of the body resembled an ape, but the lower half resembled a human, and a skeleton with such a shape would not be structurally sound. As well as that, from the footprints, he identified a mismatch between footprint size and stride length. So the size of the prints indicated a height of 8 feet, while the stride length indicated that the creature was much taller. And so this does, of course, contradict John Green's assessment as 7 feet, and his later assessment as under six foot five. So Napier did, however, say that he could not dismiss the film entirely, and so he remained on the fence about the truth of the film for the rest of his life. Despite this response, Sanderson attempted to get a story on this screening, published by the magazine Life International. Regretfully, I have concluded that the magazine's international editions rejected not use the Sasquatch speaking with in my telephone conversation with you, who all rejected Sanderson's version of events. The letter, which was reprinted in Michael McLean's book, reads as follows. Dear Dr. Sanderson, Regretfully, I have concluded that Life's international editions should not use the Sasquatch pictures. In my telephone conversation with you, I had got the clear impression that the Interior Department and the Smithsonian Institution had displayed great interest in the photographs, and that they had undertaken, or were undertaking, investigations. But, at my insistence, a representative of our Washington Bureau has talked with a number of persons at the Interior and the Smithsonian who would be concerned with such a matter, and has found no one who supports that impression. Frankly, they scoff at the Sasquatch's existence, and display considerable annoyance at the suggestion that they are pursuing the affair. They could be wrong, of course, but they make a convincing case. So, I am returning the photographs with thanks herewith. So, as well as being rejected by the very scientists that Sanderson himself convened, even one of the most famous proponents of the existence of Bigfoot at the time, Grover Krantz, would initially claim that the film looked like a person in a gorilla suit and that it was very unlikely to be real. However, he would, several years later, change his mind after a more thorough examination, where he would note features such as the peculiar gait and the flexing of the leg muscles as evidence that this was not a human in a suit. So in his 1999 book, Bigfoot Sasquatch Evidence, Krantz dedicates an entire chapter to the film, and he does give a very thorough critique of the various analyses that determine the film was a fake, and he concludes that the size and shape of the body cannot be duplicated by man. Its weight and movements correspond with each other and are just too good. 
However, here, Krantz is rather dismissive of opposing views, despite his own initial disbelief of the film. And he claims that, no matter how the Patterson film is analysed, its legitimacy has been repeatedly supported. And he dismisses those who deem the film being fake as being mostly laymen writing in popular magazines who would not know how to get a scientific paper published. However, the detractors of the film, as we've said, were academics at institutions such as the Smithsonian, whereas, apart from Krantz himself, the support of the film was mostly through Ivan Sanderson's deals with Argosy and with other magazines. So that quote seems a bit like projecting. Yeah, it seems to be the inversion of the truth, to be honest to me. But yeah, that is something of a common problem with uh, some some Bigfoot advocates. I'm not going to tire everyone with that brush, but it's a common uh, thing with some Bigfoot advocates that they like to claim, you know, scientists haven't seriously assessed this evidence or just assert that this was, you know, found to be legitimate when either it has not been actually assessed by scientists or it has been and they did not agree that it was legitimate. Yeah. There will be a, another figure in a moment who makes similar claims after listing all of the people who did analyse it. Mm. Because the other major advocate of the film, though much, late, much later than this, was Jeff Meldrum, who in his book, he actually details all of the people who analysed the film and conclude that it was real. He first lists the experts that were convened by Sanderson though he conveniently leaves out the fact that these experts were convened by Sanderson. He only states that the screening was held at the, Smith was held at the Smithsonian. So he lists John Napier. He lists Joseph Raitt, who was the chief geographer of the US Coast Guard and Geodetic Survey. He lists Vladimir Markotic, the associate professor of archaeology at the University of Calgary, and Alan Bryan who was a professor of anthropology at the University of Alberta. He claims that Napier wrote favourable comments, though he would later quote Napier's words that are, at best, neutral. He claims that Rate, Marcotic and Brian gave favourable comments, but he doesn't include any quotes or sources to back this up. And he would later quote Richard Thorrington, who was Napier's successor, as the director of primate biology at the Smithsonian, who dismisses the film as a hoax and describes it as unfair that Napier was singled out as the expert who believed the film was real, when all he said was to keep an open mind to further evidence. So, Meldrum does also spend a lot of this chapter of the book attempting to refute the statements that were made by the various scientists who analysed and dismissed the film. However, he quotes very few people who supported claims that the film was real. Of those, he quotes Bob Titmus, who analysed the tracks at Bluff Creek and declared them real, and says that, says that to him, as a taxidermist, the creature in the film looked real, but he admitted that passing judgment on the film itself was outside of his expertise. He quotes the stuntman and costume designer Janos Prohaska, who was known for his work designing and portraying apes or ape-like creatures in shows such as Gilligan's Island, Perry Mason, Land of the Giants and Star Trek, and who claimed that you could see the muscles on the body and so it didn't look like a costume at all, and that to get the effect like that you would need a 10-hour makeup job gluing the hair directly to the actor's skin. The first scientist he quotes is Don Grieve, who was a professor of biomechanics at London's Royal Free Hospital. And Grieve concludes that the film appears real if the footage was shot at 16 frames per second, but if it was shot at 24 frames per second, then it was clearly a human. Patterson would claim that the camera was normally set to 24 frames per second, but that day it was mistakenly set to 16 or 18 and there is still dispute as to which is correct. Yeah, but it didn't there's like a, a weird thing to do with that type of camera he used as well, where the knob for the frame rate was continuous, but the markings are for discrete units. Mm -hmm. So it could have been anywhere between 
probably 16 and 24 was some of the assessments that I've seen. I've not seen that. That's, that's an interesting one. Admittedly, I don't know much about cameras, so can't comment, unfortunately. Well, it was a very old Kodak model, I believe, that he was using. Apparently, there was actually a warrant out for his arrest at the time that the, f the footage was made because he had not actually returned the camera on time. <laughs> I mean, that sounds plausible, given some of the descriptions of him. <laughs> yeah. Back to Meldrum's work. The one last scientific authority that he quotes is Dmitry Donskoy, who was the former professor of biomechanics at the USSR Central Institute of Physical Culture, who worked on methods of training athletes. And he concluded that the gait could only come from habitual and automatic movements that were performed regularly, and so this could not be a person in a suit. So, my biggest issue with Meldrum's chapter on this subject, like I was saying, is prior to bringing up Grieve and Donskoy's analysis, he states that no American or Canadian scientists were inclined to undertake a systematic analysis of the film, despite the fact that he had listed a lot of scientists who had done just that, and spend several pages debating their claims. And while he is very thorough in presenting his own analysis and disputing the various conclusions that the film was a hoax, he just had very few other scientists to cite to support this, and a much larger number of scientists did conclude that the film was a fake. In Abominable Science, Loxton and Prothero do sum up the whole debate over the, re over the reality of the film with a single sentence that they expect both sides to dislike that makes sense to me, and I also expect both sides to dislike it, as they point out that no one really knows whether the film depicts a real Sasquatch or a person in a suit. Yeah, that's, that's kind of my perspective on it as well, where I personally don't believe that Bigfoot exists just based on the wider body of evidence uh, for Bigfoot and and what I see is kind of the improbability of such a creature being able to remain undetected for such a long period of time, despite such sustained interest. However, I don't think that the Patterson-Gimlin film can be proved to be a fraud. And, you know, I, I kind of de default as a result to the position that it is probably someone in a suit on the film. However, I also think the quality of the film itself, which you know, is a 16mm film, and the actual figure on it is very, very small. I don't think the quality of the film itself captures enough details of the creature to really be able to decide whether it's a fraud or not. I agree. I'm biased towards disbelieving it, but any analysis of the film is subjective and is based on, like you say, very limited quality of evidence. And so while fewer scientists have concluded that the film's real, each side of the debate is quite likely bringing their own biases in and does have very little to go on. And so there is a chance that the minority is right in this case. I also believe that we don't actually have the first, like the original film anymore. It's been lost at some point. So we're working from second generation copies at best. That does make it difficult to go for, a, to analyze it again with more modern techniques. So. Someone at some point claimed to have, so one of the people, uh, there was someone who came out and claimed that he'd proven it was a fake because he, because he'd spied what seemed to be a belt buckle around the creature's waist. It was basically proven that he was actually working from a much later generation copy of the photo and that the buckle was actually an artifact that had been introduced by repeated copy copying of the image. I believe it was by Cliff Crook who himself is a Bigfoot advocate, but who notably doesn't agree that the Patterson-Gimlin film is authentic. And he claimed to have exposed an object that appeared to be the suit's zip fastener. Ah. But then, as, uh, as I say, it was later proven to basically be a, an artifact of a later generation copy, rather than something visible on the original film. Interesting that it's a zip fastener, because... John Napier was quoted as saying, I couldn't see the zipper. Hmm. So just, just an interesting <laughs> coincidence there. Cliff Crook will come up again, yeah. by the way. 
later on. Aside from debating the film itself in terms of whether or not it's real and being entirely subjective, the other aspect that's quite often discussed in this debate is to focus on Patterson himself. I'm not going to go much into this. As we've said, Greg Long did this in 2004, meeting quite a lot of friends and family of Patterson, and concluded that Patterson had both the means and the morals to create a fake for personal gain. And while his book, An Abominable Science, do discuss at length the integrity or lack of integrity of Patterson, I personally am not going to go into a character assassination of him here. Um, I didn't know him personally. Attacking him on the podcast so many years after his death feels a bit like a cheap shot. I mean, we, we kind of did that for Ray Wallace, to be fair. True. I mean, in fairness, though, we focused on the events themselves, mostly with Ray Wallace. Yeah, I mean, I did read through portions of Greg Long's book, and I, the, the phrase I would use is muckracking. Mm. He basically st- he appears to have started with the hypothesis that Patson was a crook at the end of the day. And it, there is some interesting interviews in there. I think he interviews one of Pattinson's brothers who noted that, I think uh, for a long time it was argued by Bigfoot advocates that Patterson didn't make much in the way of money from the film, when in reality, according to one of his brothers, he received a check at one point for $100,000. Although this account was notable that the said brother could not actually remember the exact amount when questioned in more detail by Greg Long and simply said that it was, he just remembered it being a very large amount. Yeah, I've heard the 100,000 number around, yeah. Those same interviews basically characterised Patterson prior to, prior to the famous film as being basically without any major means to pull off such a hoax in terms of just the cash funds. Although, as you mentioned before, he was working with a backer on his film. Yeah, Al Diatli. Hmm. So yeah, there was, there was money coming in at the time. The two things that I, I will say about Patterson as to whether or not he's trustworthy is just to reiterate two facts. Um, one, that in his book, he tells William Rowe's story and provides his own illustrations of William Rowe's story, which do line up perfectly with the film. I know we mentioned this last time and someone kindly corrected us about the issues with the with what we said about the creature looking back over the shoulder and how that is yeah. a bi- actually a biologically accurate thing that an ape would do. Yeah, I think I think I was reading a little bit too much into that one basically. Yeah. My main issue with it is more just that it matches up so cleanly. Not the shoulder look itself, just the way that the stories are basically the same. The other fact that I will remind everyone of is that prior to filming The Bigfoot, he was working on a film that would feature a man in a Bigfoot suit pretty much immediately prior to the encounter, as I mentioned earlier. And so those two facts make me lean towards a hoax but they are still entirely circumstantial evidence and it's only fair to say that the boy who cried wolf was telling the truth the last time yeah i mean obviously patterson took any potential confession with him to his grave he maintained it was an accurate and uh true encounter that was not a hoax until his death bob gimlin has maintained that he had no part in any potential hoax on that given day so yeah i don't think there's uh, unless bob gimlin suddenly does an about face and produces the suit Hmm. or anyone else produces the suit i don't really see how it can be proven to be a fraud at this point well there is one final entry in the saga of the film while it's not producing the suit itself it does discuss the suit and the origins of it And that is the 2004 testimony of Bob Hieronymus. So after seeing a TV interview with a former manager at the film company that Patterson had worked for, where this manager claimed that Patterson had proposed the fake Bigfoot film as a loss leader in order to screen it before other movies and draw audiences to other movies, 
Hieronymus decided to come forward with his own story. He first contacted Bob Gimlin and told him that he was tired of lying, and Gimlin allegedly asked to keep his name out of it, which is a bit of a tall order considering what the film's known as. Mm. Hieronymus would go on to say that it was in July or August of 1967. Gimlin told me that Roger was going to make a film and they needed someone to wear a suit. He claimed that the suit was made of leather and synthetic fur, with football shoulder pads and a football helmet underneath to bulk up the torso and to give the distinctive head shape. He claimed that he was told to stand in the spot where we first see the Bigfoot, and not move until Patterson gave the signal. And the film does seem to show that the Bigfoot did set off from a standstill. Hieronymus described the suit as being quite claustrophobic, and that he needed helping out of it immediately after the filming. And following this, he put it in the trunk of the car that he was borrowing from his mother, and he took the film to mail it for processing. His mother and his nephew both claimed to have seen the suit in the trunk of the car, and his brothers claimed that he admitted it to them at the time, and that the story spread quite rapidly around Yakima, where he was living. Hieronymus's description of the suit is also corroborated by the couple who claimed to have made it, Philip and Amy Morris, who ran a business making animal suits for films. Morris explained that Patterson ordered a gorilla suit and describes a phone call with Patterson after he received it in which he helped Patterson to make the suit larger by telling him to bulk up the shoulders with football pads. Additionally, he said that the long arms were made by attaching a glove to a shovel handle which was then stuck in the sleeve and covered with extra fur that the Morrises would ship to Patterson. And there is one detail that's been seen in a version of the film that allegedly supports Hieronymus's story. Although, like we said earlier, this may be simply an artifact of a later copy of the film. When the Bigfoot turns and looks at the camera, a little flash of light reflects from the right eye which apparently can't be explained by an organic eye, and the left eye remains dark. So Hieronymus explained that a cloth with two eye holes was draped over the football helmet, which was why the left eye was dark. And he explains that the flash was because of a fact about him that Patterson and Gimlin weren't aware of, that he had a glass eye, and that was a reflection from his glass eye. So Greg Long did claim that enlarging the image showed that the reflection is consistent with other films that display glass eyes rather than organic eyes. But again, that is one of those where we don't know whether this was a copy of the film, whether an artifact was present in a later version, anything like that. Yeah, and it's a, an image that's already so low resolution. I'm not. I, I'm not an expert by any means on you know, the properties of film or how a glass eye would look on film. I don't know if Greg, yeah. Greg Long is either, but that, that's for such a low resolution image, that would, I'd be surprised if that detail would be captured. Yeah, even with these final claims, we do still have to say none of that, I've just said, still conclusively proves anything about the film. It adds another layer of doubt to the story but it's just as likely that Hieronymus is lying as it is that Patterson and Gimlin is lying. Hieronymus mm. says that he never got paid for his work, and so he could quite easily hold a grudge, or he could have other motives to have come forward. So, like I say, I'm sure other experts would analyse the film and say that the flash of light could be organic, could be an artefact, anything. So, yeah, short of... Bob Gimlin releasing a behind-the-scenes documentary. I'm afraid we're never going to know for sure whether the film was real or fake. The one thing I would like to just quickly add uh, about Philip Morris. Apparently, apparently Philip Morris, in the years since, did attempt to be involved in some sort of documentary or program for which he would supposedly recreate the suit. However, he f notably failed to do so. According to Bigfooter Daniel Prez, who wrote National Geographic's Noel Doxter, who was the producer, 
noted that the suit used in the recreation was in no way similar to what is depicted on the Patterson Gimlin film. So, again, that may undercut some of Philip Morris's claims in the in the Bob Hieronymus story. Yeah, sadly, every piece of evidence we give one way does have a contradiction in the other. So I think that draws the section on the Patterson Gimlin film to a close. So I think it's time I hand back to you, Charles, for the next encounter. Yes, I think we're getting into what we'd probably call the later days of Bigfoot here. Uh, given that we've now passed the most famous incident. However, there are still several significant uh, claimed events associated with Bigfoot that do require some discussion. So, Crofty, I think we can agree that whilst potentially having a Sasquatch on film, in the case of the Patterson Gimlin film, is an incredibly significant piece of evidence for most Bigfoot advocates, the actual gold standard of evidence for Bigfoot would be to either to capture a living Sasquatch or to find its remains. I'd agree with that. And this is indeed what our next case was claimed to be. Uh, it is known as the Minnesota Iceman. As we all discuss, what exactly this creature was supposed to be is something of a complex debate amongst both Bigfoot advocates and sceptics. So in 1967, right around the time that the Patterson Gimlin film uh, originated, a man by the name of Frank Hansen began to exhibit the body of a strange creature known as the Iceman at both what Mike McCleard and David Daigling would describe in their works as various carnivals and fairs throughout the American Midwest. So this account heavily involves uh, a figure which you mentioned earlier, Crofty, which is Ivan T. Sanderson. And I feel like I need to give a little bit of context around Sanderson on top of what you said to explain some of the things which happened in the course of this investigation. Ivan Sanderson, as we covered in part one, was probably the first person to widely popularize the specific idea of Bigfoot in his work, Abominable Snowman, Legend Come to Life. I think it's important to know Ivan Sanderson was something of a media personality as well during this time period. So he did make a number of rather prominent uh, radio and television appearances, one of which I will discuss shortly. So according to an article later written on the subject by him, the Iceman was first spotted at a Milwaukee exhibition in the autumn of 1967 by a man by the name of Terry Cullen. So Terry Cullen is described in a couple of different ways in the sources I consulted. According to some sources, he was a college zoology major, and according to others, he was an animal importer. And we'll come back to that second point shortly. So after discovering the creature, Cullen tried to get some interest in investigating it, going amongst mainstream anthropologists. But after failing to get much interest, Cullen contacted Sanderson himself in 1968, and Sanderson claims to have succeeded in examining the creature later that same year. For this examination, he was accompanied by a Dr. Bernard Huvelmans, I apologise if I'm butchering that, who was a Belgian-born academic and cryptozoologist. So Huvelmans hasn't really come up before for us, but for wider context, he is basically the man who created the modern cryptozoology field through his 1955 book On the Track of Unknown Animals, which, according to many of the sources I consulted for this episode, claims originally coined the phrase cryptozoology. So according to this examination, the Iceman consisted of a hairy, bipedal creature, about six feet tall, which was kept encased in a block of ice inside a plate glass freezer. Its skin was covered in dark hair that was between three to four inches long, and from its exposed genitalia, it was concluded that the creature was in fact a male. Not only had the creature apparently been shot through the eyes, one of which still remained and could be seen through the eye dangling from its socket, but it also apparently had an open wound on its arm, which appeared to be broken. According to Sanderson and Huvelmans, the creature also gave off a smell of putrefaction in the places where its flesh was not fully covered by the ice. 
Satisfied as a result that the creature was real and that it was neither fully human nor fully ape, the two investigators photographed and sketched the creature. However, and this is a big however, they were not given permission to thaw out the creature from the ice by Frank Hansen, as he claimed he only had the creature on loan from the Iceman's actual owner and couldn't give permission. As a result, the conclusions that they reached were only based on what they could see through the ice. However, Hansen did assure them at the time that the creature had been examined by scientists in Oklahoma, who took hair, tissue, and blood samples. So according to Sanderson's later article, from these samples, it was found that the blood proved to contain both red and white cells. However, no samples of either this blood or any of its hair were, however, available to him. Though Sanderson apparently did later track down some of the alleged hairs from the creature, which he describes as coming from a university laboratory in the South. And after asking for copies of reports on these from, quote, great experts, I was told that none were available, but that the hair had been pronounced to be more like those of Mongolian humans than any other known man or animal. So according to Lauren Coleman's work, Bigfoot, the first major publicity of this creature attracted came during Christmas week of 1968, when Sanderson, who was making an appearance on, on of all things, The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, mentioned it as part of his interview. This publicity would continue the next year when both Sanderson and Huvelmans produced articles publicising the Iceman, which they quickly nicknamed Bozo. Sanderson would publish his articles in the magazines Genus and Argosy. So you might remember that's one of the magazines which covered the Patterson-Gimlin film uh, due to Sanderson getting in contact with them. In this case, I'm not sure if this was the case at the time of the Patterson-Gimlin film, but the reason that The Iceman was likely published in Argosy is because Sanderson was the scientific editor at the time. I don't know if that's the case with the Patterson Goodwin film, as I say, but that may also have helped him in terms of promoting the find. I believe with the film, it was more just a rights deal, and then the scientific editor position came later. But I could be mistaken on that. Okay, fair enough. Huvelmans himself published an article in the scientific journal, Bulletin of the Royal Institute of Natural Sciences of Belgium. In his report, Huvelmans would claim that the creature was a form of Neanderthal and would even go as far as to propose a scientific name for the creature, which is a theme we'll be revisiting later, specifically Homo pongoides. According to John Napier's 1974 book Bigfoot, Sanderson would look to promote the creature further and contacted Napier, who as you mentioned before, was then the head of the Smithsonian's primatology department in an attempt to get an official government investigation going into the Iceman. In response to this, the Smithsonian issued a press release and Hansen was informed that the National Museum would soon be investigating his creature. At this point, however, according to Napier, Frank Hansen abruptly withdrew the creature from public view and replaced it on his tour of what was described as a clearly latex model. Apparently, Hansen would drop out of sight briefly around the time the switch was made. However, later he would claim the reason for this was that he was made to do so by the creature's actual owner, who by his account was a reclusive millionaire who was based somewhere out of California and who had grown uncomfortable with the attention that the creature was now getting. To a Bigfoot sceptic, this might seem like an extremely convenient timing that the claimed body of this creature would vanish right as actual investigators were getting involved with examining it. But either way, the original creature that Sanderson and Huvelmans claimed to have examined has not been seen since. We haven't actually said anything yet about how or where Hansen claims to have gotten this creature and one of the more dubious aspects of the Iceman story is that his exact story of how he acquired it changed significantly over time. Later he would also 
make a habit of stating to people when interviewed regarding the creature that he was not under oath, which, again, seems like a slightly dubious thing to say. His original claim, as best I can tell, which appeared in Sanderson's 1969 article in Argosy, is that the creature was found floating in a block of sea ice in international waters somewhere in the Bering Sea by a Russian sealing ship, from where it somehow made its way to a Chinese port. Here it is claimed that it was promptly seized by the authorities and that it disappeared into communist China. Eventually, however, it reappeared in Hong Kong, at which point it presumably made its way to its then present owner. However, as a sign of how much Hansen was prone to change his story, in this same article, Ivan Sanderson would also note an alternative story that it was found by a Japanese whaling outfit off the coast of Kamchatka, then taken to Japan and sold on to an exporter in Hong Kong. Sanderson would also note that he had heard still further explanations, but that he had no verifying details or ship names for any of them. Now, according to Joshua Bluebirds, Hansen would also later claim that the body was found not in the sea, but in a river. Then he claimed that none of this was in fact correct, and it had merely been bought from an exporter in Hong Kong. Later still, he would confess that in fact none of these explanations were true, and that he had in fact shot the creature himself in the woods of Minnesota. Which, as explanations go, aligns the creature much closer to the idea of Bigfoot. Okay, so Crofty, I think we can agree that the combination of these elaborate stories from Hansen and the sudden switch out of the creature when investigators were getting involved kind of starts to lend this whole thing something of a comical element. Yeah, th- that chain of custody alone is just mm. ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, well, ridiculous is an interesting word because uh, it gets more ridiculous. Oh, great. <laughs> so according to John Napier's book, and I think repeated in Lauren Coleman's book as well, the fact that Huvelmans had attempted to assign a taxonomical name to the creature may have almost resulted in some degree of legal problems for all involved. So specifically, Huvelmans assigning this creature to a genus of Homo, which implied that it was in some way human, and Hansen's claim that he had shot it himself, led to the secretary of the Smithsonian, S. Dylan Ripley to contact the head of the FBI in writing, uh, who happened to be one J. Edgar Hoover. According to Joshua Blue Burrs, however, a slightly different version of these events happened. Apparently, Ripley was actually motivated by the fact that he suspected that some form of crime had been committed in the procurement of the creature, and he thought that in proving this, Hansen would be forced to forfeit the body to the Smithsonian. Probably luckily for everyone involved, the FBI apparently decided that this was a waste of their time and no further investigation was forthcoming from them. In the meantime, according to David Daigling, John Napier and some other officials had investigated the Iceman further and found that a company on the West Coast had apparently been approached by Hansen and had made him an Iceman figure before any theoretical original ever went on display. Napier, as a result, concluded that there had been no original Iceman, that it had always been the same latex figurine, and that regardless, the creature's body proportions were too improbable for it to have been a real primate. As such, the Smithsonian Institute issued the following statement, washing its hands of the affair. Quote, The Smithsonian Institution is satisfied that the creature is simply a carnival exhibition made of latex rubber and hair. The original model and the present so-called substitute are one and the same. According to Joshua Bluebirds, the Smithsonian's curator of physical anthropology, J. Lawrence Angel, also said around this time that the Smithsonian would no longer accept claim Sasquatch reports, as there was too much tomfoolery in the subject. Ultimately, Napier himself would conclude that both Sanderson and Huvelmans had been the victims of an elaborate hoax, and that both of them had had a perhaps understandable lapse in judgment when presented with potential evidence of a creature that they had long thought to exist. 
Napier's conclusion seems to have been largely the position taken by Bigfoot skeptics in the decades since. And if you pick up a book by a skeptical source, most of them tend to refer to it outright as the Iceman hoax. It should be noted, however, that Sanderson himself strongly disagreed with this conclusion, and uh, his explanation was quite interesting. Instead, he claimed that the Iceman was genuine. However, that Hansen and Terry Cullen, who you'll remember Sanderson claimed originally brought this, the Iceman to his attention, had in fact shot a genuine wild man. However, on receiving unexpected publicity and hearing that the FBI might become involved, they decided to pretend the Iceman had been a fraud all along as a way to throw off the authorities. For me, this sort of argument sounds more like something that was made up after the fact to justify why nobody was actually available to be examined by anyone other than them. And this combined with Hansen repeatedly changing his story and the fact that the only likeness that's ever been seen by anyone outside of those three is a latex model. This is enough for me personally to agree with the skeptical position and label this a hoax. So amongst wider Bigfoot advocates, I found that the Iceman seems to have something of a mixed reputation. Some, such as Jeff Meldrum, ignored it as a piece of evidence in their work altogether, whilst Grover Krantz, in his work Bigfoot Sasquatch Evidence, came to the conclusion that he was inclined to think it was real, but would reserve his judgment until he got the opportunity to examine the thing itself. By comparison, Lauren Coleman and his work Bigfoot argued in favour of the creature, and I do agree with David Daigling's uh, assertion that his writing took on something of a conspiratorial bent, as he notes that the creature disappeared under mysterious circumstances, and also publicised another claim by Hansen that he had apparently switched the creature out of a latex replica that had been made in Hollywood whilst he was on a tour of Canada, as he was not allowed to get back through customs because they thought that he might be transporting a cadaver. An interesting postscript to all of this is, in 2013, what was claimed to be the original latex model from Hansen's exhibit was actually put up for auction on eBay. So this information specifically comes from the website Doubtful News in an article called Step right up and see the Minnesota Iceman sold by Sharon A. Hill. And according to her article, it was also posted in the Huffington Post, although the article, by her claims, treated the model as if it was a real creature. This model was then later purchased by a man by the name of Steve Boosty, who owns an attraction known as the Museum of the Weird in Austin, Texas, who has now placed it back on public display. So. If you go and find the original article by Sharon A. Hill on the Wayback Machine, there are pictures of it available, and yeah, it looks a lot like the photos and pictures drawn of the Iceman by Sanderson back in the day. So that, Crofty, is the somewhat ludicrous affair known as the Minnesota Iceman. That's the word for it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And it only gets crazier from there. Because, <laughs> mm. yeah, if, if, you en if you enjoyed the Minnesota Iceman, this next bit's a ride. <laughs> yeah, and I, I've been trying to stress, like in part one, we have tried to give the advocate position a fair shake. But I'm sorry, each time, so far at least, that we've examined a major piece of evidence, it's under my personal criteria of evidence, it has not really held water. Mm. Th this next one, at least, is generally admitted that it's all fake. All the evidence was, all the evidence is there to prove that it wasn't real. You know, there's similar sketchy things around bodies and things. It it's going to be fun, <laughs> okay? <laughs> because yes, though, towards the tail end of the Iceman fiasco, there were the beginnings of another story that sort of combines elements from a few different aspects of previous stories we've discussed so far. And that is the story that is known as the Bosberg Footprints. 
So, like I say, towards the end of when the affair with the Iceman was wrapping up, and so at the height of the Patterson Gimlin film's popularity, which is November 1969, there would be another set of footprints that would bring Bigfoot hunters, anthropologists, and the media up to Washington State again, to the town of Bosberg, which is in Stevens County, just south of the Canadian border. So on November 24th, 1969, there were a set of footprints discovered at a garbage dump in the town. However, sources do differ slightly as to the original discovery. I can't unfortunately find a copy of the original local newspapers, so basically going by Joshua Bluebirds and Lotson and Prothero's claims here, in that at the time, newspapers were reporting that the prints were discovered by a local Bigfoot hunter who was named Ivan Marks, and who much of the story in the coming weeks will centre around. However, later there were instead claims that the prints were discovered by a man named Joe Rhodes, who was a butcher from the nearby town of Colville, who would then get in touch with Marks because he was known as a local Bigfoot hunter. So, the tracks themselves were left in soft soil around the garbage dump, and the right foot was severely malformed, which led to the tracks being nicknamed Cripple Foot. So, upon inspecting the tracks, Marks would call René de Hinden, Bob Titmus, and John Green. And while John Green was busy promoting his book at the time, de Hinden would arrive around three days later, and Titmus not far behind. However, the popularity of Bigfoot that had been inspired by the Patterson Gimlin film would have a detrimental effect, as in the three intervening days, the news would draw a lot of interested locals to the site, and all but one print would be destroyed. This one print was only saved by covering it with a cardboard box. Upon inspecting this last footprint, de Hinden took a cast, and this image led to rumours to spread that the reason that this particular Bigfoot was in a garbage dump was that it was injured and it couldn't hunt or gather in the wild. But this explanation de Hinden disagreed with at the time. So, upon Bob Titmus's arrival, he began to hang pieces of meat from nearby trees around the site as bait, but with no success, and so Titmus soon left. De Hinden decided to stay on. He rented a trailer on Ivan Marks' property, and the two continued to set bait. On December the 13th, the pair and another local man named Jim Hopkins were checking sites along the banks of Roosevelt Lake. And by a railway crossing at the Columbia River, almost immediately upon getting out of the car, Marks found a large number of tracks, which again displayed the crippled right foot. Marks would get back in the car, and the three would rush to get camera equipment. And so on the way back to get equipment, they passed a jeep heading away from the site, and the Hinden, who was suspicious of hoaxes, had Jim make a note of the plates. When they later found the owners of the jeep, the owners claimed that they had seen the prints, and I quote, got the hell out of there fast. So, upon returning with the cameras, the three investigated the route of the tracks, which totaled 1,089 footprints. They found that the tracks started at the riverbank, and would turn back and forth aimlessly across the area, crossing and recrossing the railway line, crossing and recrossing the road, and even a few times crossing a metre-high barbed wire fence before returning to the river. There were eight hairs found at one crossing on the fence, a print in one spot that suggested a large creature had lied down there, and at one point the creature had stopped to urinate. The deformed foot matched the previous print, in which the third toe gave a very light impression at the base, and so it was thought to be very badly twisted or partially missing, and the little toe was sticking out at a sharp angle, and the whole foot was slightly bent with two lumps visible at the sides. So while de Hinden was initially optimistic, he became much more sceptical after tracing the complete route. He said that the route itself seemed quite artificial, 
and that there was no reason for the Bigfoot to keep trekking back and forth in the same area. And with the tracks emerging from and returning to the same river, he also questioned where the creature would have come from and where it would be going, which is a question that seems quite rare in discussion of Bigfoot tracks even now. And further search around the river found no evidence of where the Bigfoot would have entered the river as it arrived or X to the river on the other side as it left. So shortly after this find, a few other big names in the Bigfoot hunting world would join De Hinden in Bosberg. So John Green finished his book tour and drove down from Toronto. Roger Patterson would later join them. And Grover Krantz, who was at the time teaching at Washington State University, would also visit. But despite the best efforts of this entire band of hunters, no further tracks would be found over the coming weeks, which De Hinden would claim increased his scepticism. He also described Ivan Marks as acting strangely, hiding at home rather than joining the hunt, and instead attempting to entertain the various other hunters. By early January, everyone had left. However, interest was soon sparked again when a prospector named Joe Metlow came to town and announced that he had captured a live Sasquatch and would sell it to the highest bidder. Pretty much immediately, a bidding war erupted, with Patterson, DeHinden and Green as the main players and various other names pretty much lining up into these three camps. Metlow kept details of this Sasquatch to a minimum, however, the various camps all managed to get information that it was allegedly being kept on the nearby Frisco Mountain, which caused each camp to get on snowmobiles and begin searching, while also keeping tabs on each other to ensure that no one could cut a deal behind the other's backs. It's starting to sound like a carry-on film, this. Yeah, <laughs> it, it gets more ridiculous. <laughs> so, Metlo would very conveniently drop his claim of a live Bigfoot without any explanation and would instead claim that his sister had a Bigfoot leg in her freezer and would restart the entire bidding process. And nobody questioned, uh, nobody questioned this no. even after the Iceman fiasco. Uh, that's the amazing part, yeah. <laughs> I say everybody was just way too focused on getting this. Nobody thought to just stop and think how ridiculous it was. <laughs> So eventually, a deal for this Bigfoot leg was made in which John Green, Bob Titmus, and Grover Krantz would share the prize and cut Patterson and De Hinden out, which De Hinden felt taught him a lot about the people he had been working with. Yeah, that's something we've not really had much of a chance to go into in these, uh, these episodes, but the, there's a lot of grudges between the more prominent first generation Bigfoot advocates. That's it. And several of them seem to start from this bidding war, roughly. <laughs> so uh, I think you can guess just how this, p this part of the story ends. Does it end with someone having a Bigfoot leg? No. Or at least no one we know having a Bigfoot leg. <laughs> it ended with Metlow disappearing with the money. <sighs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so for the next six months, Marx would try and keep a bit of interest in the findings in the area by regularly announcing a new small finding, like an individual footprint, individual handprint, or a sign of a creature having slept in the bushes, until finally, the following October, he made the biggest announcement since 1967, that he had a full-colour movie of the injured Bigfoot. And so, for a third time, the full cast of Bigfoot hunters descended on Bosberg. John Green, upon seeing the film, declared in no uncertain terms that it was genuine, and a third bidding war broke out. And it's at this point that a player we haven't seen yet in these episodes entered, a big game hunter turned conservationist by the name of Peter Byrne. Byrne had previously made a name for himself hunting Yeti 
in Nepal in the 1950s and had recently moved to Washington, D.C. and founded the International Wildlife Conservation Society, which is a bit of a 180 from being a hunter. He struck a deal with Ivan Marx, where he would pay Marx quite a large retainer fee and provide all the equipment that he needed for further Bigfoot hunting, but that the film would be kept in a safe deposit box. Marx's first task for this new job was to investigate a set of tracks that had turned up around the same time in the nearby town of Arden, in which a further 5,000 footprints around the town garbage dump, the grocery store, and the surrounding fields had appeared. This job was, however, all a distraction. Byrne had suspicions that Marx had faked the film, and he simply needed Marx busy, and the film kept safe and out of the public eye until he could prove it, so these new footprints were quite well-timed for him. He quickly found out that Marx had bought enough fur for a suit in Spokane shortly before he announced the film, and then went on to investigate the site of the film itself. He found the location with the help of some of the locals, and he identified landmarks that were much smaller in reality than they appeared on the film, thus proving that Marx had faked the film's perspective in order to make the Bigfoot seem larger. And by moving and taking photos around the site, he also found where different shots had been taken in order to make it appear that the Bigfoot had been moving when in fact the Bigfoot had stayed in quite a small area and the cameraman had moved. And finally, he compared Marx's photographs that he'd taken with stills from the film, and he showed that the shadows were different, so proving that they had been taken hours apart rather than seconds, and so the alleged Bigfoot must have been working with the cameraman the entire time. When Byrne attempted to confront Marx, he found that Marx had literally disappeared in the night. He'd left his door open and flapping in the wind, as it was described, and his belongings strewn across the yard. And the film that he had stored in the safe deposit box wasn't even the hoax film that he'd made. It was actually a tape of old Mickey Mouse clips. <laughs> Told you it got more ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. The Arden footprints that Marx was distracted by were also quite quickly revealed to be fake. A local bricklayer named Ray Pickens had admitted to creating them, said that they were inspired by the cripple footprints and claimed that he wanted to show just how easy it was to fake these tracks. He produced the fake feet, which were carved from a pair of 10-inch planks and nailed to boots, and he demonstrated that he could very easily make the 54-inch stride that was needed to produce the tracks. Despite all of this, some people still believed that the tracks found by Marx and de Hinden were real. Some people particularly Grover Krantz, claimed that the tracks were too good to fake, with Grover Krantz dedicating several pages of his book to the complexity of the injured foot's anatomy. John Napier also felt that a detail like the crippled foot required too much knowledge and effort for someone to go to the trouble of faking, and the argument was also made that there were too many to fake. All of this despite Pickens faking over 5,000 footprints with a similarly crippled foot. Yeah, I think this this is a, a kind of a recurring theme you sometimes get with Bigfoot advocates of where there seems to be something of a willingness to underestimate how devious hoaxes can be. Yeah, even when the hoaxes come out and prove that they've done it. Well, to be to be fair, Ivan Marx didn't kind of come out and say, "Yes, I faked it." Like, this is the, late, the later footprints, yeah. Yeah. I mean, when, when Pickens came out and showed that he'd faked basically mm. the, same, the same thing. Yeah. So I do think that given the circumstances surrounding Marx, the idea that those original footprints were real is a bit too much of a suspension of disbelief. Yeah, I think it was either David Daigling or it might have been Daniel Luxton who described them as radioactive. Yeah, and John Green in particular was very embarrassed by the revelation that the Mar Marx's film 
was a fake. And so I don't think he ever spoke again on anything related to Marx or the prints he found. He did continue to be active in the community, but I don't, I don't know about that. Yeah, just the, the, those particular prints he and a lot of others very much avoided. Whereas some people, such as Grover Krantz, instead doubled down. And that is the Bosberg Footprints. Mm-hmm. Like I say, it was a bit of a ride. <laughs> okay. So we're probably now going to move to what I would say is the most recent significant find associated with Bigfoot. By no means here, by the way, are we trying to provide a chronicle of every single Bigfoot incident out there because you know that way madness lies mm. and exhaustion yeah so we we really have tried to focus on major significant finds the last significant find associated with bigfoot that we were able to find is what is known as the skookum cast so the skookum cast is a plaster cast that claims to contain the partial impression of the body of a Sasquatch taken from wet mud. According to Mike McLeod's book, Anatomy of a Beast, the cast was collected in the South Washington woods in September of the futuristic year of 2000 by a group known as the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization. So very big gap between this event and the Bosberg prints. The discovery of this find was originally posted on the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization website. I'm going to refer to them as the BFRO from now on. And this post claimed that the cast was collected by a group of 10 BFRO researchers at the Gifford Pinshot National Forest. This group used a variety of equipment in their hunt, which is claimed to include a boombox to broadcast claimed Bigfoot vocalizations, a thermal camera, a high-sensitivity microphone, what are described as pheromone chips, I couldn't find a further explanation as to what that meant, and fruit to use as bait. After searching the area for six days and nights, during which time they claimed they heard unusual sounds, some of which came in response to the broadcast screams with the boombox, and they detected both Sasquatch tracks and bipedal movement in the area, on the sixth evening, They placed fruit and peanuts along a road where screams had been heard. On the seventh day, they returned to the site and found a large depression in the mud at the edge of a nearby shallow pool. This depression was cast using what is described as more than 200 pounds of plaster and upon cleaning and examination was found to include what is claimed to be an animal's left forearm, hip, thigh and heel. So shortly afterwards, this cast was examined by a group of leading Bigfoot advocates, which included Grover Krantz, John Green, and Jeff Meldrum. And around the same time, the Idaho State University issued a press release that contained the following information. For reference, Jeff Meldrum, I think, is employed by Idaho State University. So I took this press release from the BFRO website, which archived it, and it reads as follows. The imprint of what appears to be a large animal's left forearm, hip, thigh, and heel was discovered on September 22nd in a muddy wallow near Mount Adams in South Washington State by a Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization expedition in the Gifford Pinochet National Forest. The investigating team, including Meldrum, Dr. Grover Krantz, a retired physical anthropologist from Washington State University, Dr. John Binder-Nagel, a Canadian wildlife biologist, John Green, a retired Canadian journalist and author, and Dr. Ron Brown, exotic animal handler and healthcare administrator, all examined the cast and agreed that it cannot be attributed to any commonly known northwestern animal and may represent an unknown primate. After the cast was cleaned, extensive impressions of hair on the buttock and thigh surfaces and a fringe of longer hair along the forearm were evident. Meldrum identified what appeared to be skin ridge patterns on the heel, comparable to fingerprints, that are characteristic of primates. The ridge characteristics are consistent with other examples from Sasquatch footprints Meldrum has studied in collaboration with Officer Jimothy Chilcutt 
a latent fingerprint examiner from the Conroe, Texas Police Department. The anatomy of the heel, ankle, and Achilles tendon were also distinct and consistent with models of the Sasquatch foot derived by Meldrum after examining hundreds of alleged Sasquatch footprints. Hair samples collected at the scene and from the cast itself and examined by Dr. Henna Farenbach, a biomedical research scientist from Beaverton, Oregon, were primarily of deer, elk, coyote, and bear, as was expected since the tracks in the wallow were mostly of those animals. However, based on characteristics matching those of otherwise indeterminate primate hairs collected in association with other Sasquatch sightings, he identified a single distinctly primate hair as Sasquatch. So, the main alternative argument that has been raised against these conclusions by the cast's discoverers is that they actually represent an impression that was made by a kneeling elk. This claim actually came from the Bigfoot advocate Cliff Crook, who runs the organization Bigfoot Central, and as who we mentioned before, was one of the figures who doubted the authenticity of the Patterson Gimlin film. So, according to David Daigling, Crook himself does have some controversies hovering over him. So, he has been accused of doctoring Bigfoot photos, and we also have the zipper incident that we discussed before. However, he did write an analysis on his organization's website that claimed that as elk hairs and tracks were found all over the impression's vicinity, that more should have been done to eliminate this creature as a possible source of the impression. He also noted that the claimed heel imprint in the cast was simply the result of the elk kneeling, and that the hair impressions could just as easily have been made by the elk's torso. So, some backing for this argument was given by award-winning journalist Mark Hume, who noted in an article for the National Post in March of 2001, which I was able to get through the Wayback Machine, that from his own examination of the cast, that there were in fact elk tracks on the cast itself, and as noted from the previous press release, the BFRO did not deny that there were elk tracks in the area at the time that the cast was collected. Where he did slightly differ from Crook, however, is he believed that the impression was the hindquarters of an elk. The BFRO also admitted that no Bigfoot tracks were found in the vicinity of the impression, though they did claim to finding Bigfoot tracks elsewhere, which led to Bigfoot advocate Daniel Perez to agree with Crook's reasoning in a personal communication with David Daigling. So, outside of this dispute, there are also a number of factors surrounding the collection of the Skookum cast that do raise a degree of suspicion. So, going by the circumstances reported by the BFRO, we are expected to believe that this creature, upon coming across food on the ground, chose rather than to simply pick it up, it instead lay down in the mud and then reached across the puddle in order to collect the fruit. So, in response to this being pointed out, the BFRO has made the argument that the creature did not wish to leave any sign of its presence, as shown by the lack of tracks around the impression. So, to avoid making any signs of its footprints in the mud, it chose to lie down instead. Where this argument kind of falls apart for me is you have an animal that was attempting to remain undetected that then chose to lie down in the mud and leave an impression of its entire body. That sounds to me like leaving a much larger trace of its presence than any footprints. Hmm, it's not the most intelligent animal, if that is the reasoning behind it. David Daigling and Mike McCle McLeod would also both imply in their respective works that it was very convenient that the group happened to have over 200 pounds of plaster on them at the time in order to cast the impression. Though for me, I don't think that one is completely outside the realms of possibility, as we do know that using large amounts of plaster to cast footprints is a common practice amongst Bigfoot advocates in the various incidents we've discussed here. And they did indeed claim to have found other footprints during the six-day span they were there. However, I do agree with both uh, David Daigling and Mike McCleard that it is a very interesting coincidence that this expedition happened to find a never-before-seen piece of Bigfoot evidence, when it turns out that 
this whole expedition was being staged and filmed at the behest of the production company behind the cryptozoology series Animal X that it turns out had specifically contacted the BFRO asking for them to provide evidence for Bigfoot's existence. That's a bit sketchy. Yeah. What the BFRO website also does not mention is that according to a 2008 Vanity Fair article entitled Everything's Bigfoot in Texas by Eric Spitznagel, which covered that year's Texas Bigfoot conference, uh, Dr. Henne Farenbach, who did the hair analysis for the cast, is not much of an impartial scientist. By all accounts, he is very much a Bigfoot true believer and a self-proclaimed Bigfoot expert who has made some somewhat outlandish statements, which were included in the article, and that reminded me somewhat of Ray Wallace's various statements about Bigfoot from part one. So, for example, he has claimed that when running, Bigfoot can move 30 feet in a single step, so it has a stride of 10 metres, that it has been observed to carry two 200-pound pigs under its arms whilst walking, and on, on another occasion to carry three goats whilst doing the same, that it enjoys wrestling, tickle fights, and in something which stretches the clean tag of our podcast quite a lot, orgies. <laughs> in particular, he apparently has given detailed descriptions of these in various talks, in which they are described as generally quite orderly and polite. <laughs> uh, I will not go any further, because... Again, this is a clean tag podcast, but I will leave that point where it is. Outside of this being the man who made the identification of the Sasquatch hair, I also found it interesting that only one of the hairs found on the cast could possibly have been linked to a primate, when one would have thought if this was a cast taken from a Sasquatch that had laid down in mud, the majority of hairs would have been from the creature. Yeah, I would definitely leave more than one hair lying around wherever I laid down, back when I had hair. Hmm. Second bold joke. As da- Yeah, that's uh, number two on the counter. As David Daigling notes, it's also uncertain what standards Henno was using to identify the soul hole as Sasquatch were, um, and later attempts to extract DNA from the hair sample recovered from the site were unsuccessful. Uh, Daigling also noted that at the time of his book, there had been little attempt to follow up on the cast's initial announcement by the publication of an in-depth scientific examination. Looking around, as best I can tell, no such analysis has been forthcoming in the time since, although I may have missed this. It's entirely possible that something may have happened in the nearly two decades since. So from all of this, I'm inclined to be charitable and not declare the Skookum cast an outright hoax, simply because no one seems to have been able to conduct a detailed examination of the cast outside of its initial announcement. However, I do think that the circumstances of its collection do leave wide open the possibility of either a willful misidentification, if not a potential hoax. And personally, I judge it to be a less than credible piece of evidence for the existence of an unknown primate throughout Northern America. Okay, Crofty, so now that we've finished recounting the various uh, major incidents and pieces of claimed evidence for Bigfoot, I think we're going to spend a little bit of time for the rest of this episode talking about some of the wider proof associated with Bigfoot, including things such as Bigfoot sightings and potential explanations, some theories by Bigfoot advocates, for how such a creature could exist, if it does indeed exist in North America. And I think first you're going to give us a description of a thread we haven't really touched so far in this podcast, which is the various attempts that have been made to get DNA testing from Sasquatch hairs. Yes, because there have been a few attempts published, unfortunately, unfortunately none relating to hair from the Skookum cast that I could find. So, before I go into the papers themselves, I'll explain a little bit of background of recent attempts to bring a bit more scientific legitimacy to Bigfoot. Because most scientific journals 
don't accept submissions of cryptozoology papers. And so cryptozoologists have had to publish their own peer-reviewed journals where they can. Most notably, since 2012, Jeff Meldrum has published the Relict Hominid Inquiry, which he describes as the objective of the RHI is to promote research and provide a refereed venue for the dissemination of scholarly peer-reviewed papers exploring and evaluating the possible existence and nature of relict hominid species around the world. So, as we've said about Meldrum, he is a professor of anthropology, and so he obviously has a good understanding of the scientific publishing process and is able to do, is able to do this all properly. He's got a full editorial board for his journal, um, which includes researchers in quite a diverse range of relevant fields. Most notably, Professor George Schala, who is a mammalian zoologist who is described as the world's most preeminent field biologist. Schala himself admits to being a Bigfoot skeptic, but he believes that the subject should still be studied scientifically and without bias, so his involvement does lend the journal some credibility. And looking at their website and submission guidelines, everything is very clearly done by the book. However, this does mean that there are very few actual research papers. There are only 15 research papers in the 10 years that the journal has been published, as there are very few scientists properly researching Bigfoot. Papers do range in topics from analysis of the Patterson-Gimlin film and analysis of the anatomy of the creature depicted in the film, to geographical analysis of Bigfoot reports to direct future searches. But here I'm going to discuss one paper by the retired analytical chemist and Bigfoot blogger Haskell V. Hart, who reviewed the four previous attempts to analyse alleged cryptid DNA, which included Sasquatch and Yeti. Before any Bigfoot believers get excited... I will start by saying that none of the four papers reviewed found Sasquatch or Yeti DNA. So the main focus of Hart's review was in determining the viability of the methods used and recommendations for refining those methods further in order to make any future DNA analysis that did claim to have discovered Sasquatch DNA and show that it was carried out to the best possible standard. A new species has never yet been identified before without an actual specimen. So any study showing DNA from hair that could only be from an unknown primate must be airtight. Of the four papers that Hart discussed, he praised the methods of three of the studies. These three were a 2004 study by Michelle Milkovich of Brussels University, who was studying supposed Yeti samples a 2005 study by Dave Coltman and Corey Davis of the University of Alberta, who were studying hair found near the site of a Bigfoot sighting in North America, but I can't access the original paper, so I'm afraid can't be more specific on that. And also a 2014 study by Brian Sykes of Oxford University, who studied over 30 samples from around the world. Oh, I think I know Brian Sykes. Like he's an actual like let me just check. He is an actual scientist. <laughs> he's the guy who did the Seven Daughters of Eve book, isn't he? Let me have a look. Yeah, he is. Yeah. He um he like made the claim I think it's been mostly overturned, a lot of his theories. Yeah, he, he had like uh, uh he, he had a relatively influential DNA model of potential waves uh, of migrations and genetic makeups of Britain and Ireland. For example, and I think he claimed that the majority of the world's population draws their maternal mitochondrial DNA from seven women, which he named the seven daughters of. Oh. I, I think, yeah, I think a lot of, I think a lot of this has been overturned by more refined methods. But he is, he was, I should say, an actual, an actual authoritative researcher. I believe also the first person to retrieve uh, a DNA or ancient DNA from a bone. Yeah, yeah. I think you're right. Hmm. This guy has credentials. Yeah, this is this is a real serious scientist. Yeah. <laughs> and because these were actual 
scientists with actual credentials, you will not be surprised to learn that each of the studies reported no Sasquatch or unknown primate DNA. But Hart did praise all of their methods and essentially find that they, they were all very sound. So Milkovich's work showed that the alleged Yeti DNA was in fact from a horse. However, Milkovich did publish the study as an April Fool's joke in which they joked that the DNA was a Yeti but that the Yeti must be a close relative of the horse <laughs> rather than a primate. I've got a, I've got a similar account coming up to that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Despite the fact that it was published as a joke paper, Hart did say that the methods were a very good example of how an unknown sample would be identified as a new primate in the ways that it compared with other known animal DNA. Hart gave similar praise to Coleman and Davis's methods, in which they found that their sample was a bison. He discussed Sykes's methods in some detail, again giving them high praise, but coming with several recommendations to ensure that no contamination was introduced into the samples. But he did deem that all of the conclusions were sound. Sykes identified all of the samples that he used as known mammals, which included one human. 10 bears, 4 canines, 4 cows, 2 raccoons, 1 sheep, 1 deer, 1 porcupine, and 1 Malaysian tapir. The fourth paper that was discussed is the controversial one. It was published by Melba Ketchum, who now runs the Sasquatch Genome Project, and it's quite a questionable paper. It was the only one which claimed to have identified a novel hominid creature. However, there are several others, including Hart, including Ellen Tarr of Midwestern University, and including Sharon Hill, who is a scientific consultant for various cryptozoology and paranormal investigation groups, would all point out in their reviews of the paper that the data does not actually show a novel hominid or primate. And instead, the data in the paper itself shows that the DNA samples are closer to the polar bear than to any primate, and that the claims made about that data were unfounded. As well as this, Ketchum made claims of human mitochondrial DNA, which for those who don't know, is DNA that is currently thought to be exclusively passed down from the mother in these samples. And from this, Ketchum concluded that, and I quote, Nevertheless, the data conclusively proves that the Sasquatch exists as an extant hominin and are a direct maternal descendant of modern humans. All the reviews of the paper point out that Ketchum's methods were very susceptible to contamination that there was no guarantee that the samples weren't contaminated in the field prior to collection, and that she's giving a very conclusive statement on very inconclusive evidence. Ellen Tarr's review is particularly scathing, tearing apart pretty much every aspect of the methods quite meticulously. All of the problems that were identified in Tarr's review explain the most sketchy thing about the paper, which is the very unconventional route through which it was published. So to give a brief explanation, when a paper is submitted to a scientific journal, it's sent to between two and four other scientists in the same field who will look for any flaws in the paper that they can find. Yeah, usually anonymous, but I think I've done it before, you know, a couple of dozen times when I used to be a researcher. And you do often get the option to identify yourself in the process. Yeah, and the paper can potentially be rejected outright by all of these reviewers if the methods aren't good enough, or if the conclusions drawn don't match the results. The paper can alternatively be sent back with a list of recommendations, which can range from doing more research, providing more information on the methods or more supplementary data, or editing the conclusions if the reviewers don't think that the conclusions are supported by the data. 
So essentially, this is how science regulates itself. Other experts in your field have to determine if your work is up to their standards before it can be published. And after failing to get her paper published this way, Ketchum instead decided to bypass the process. She founded a journal named the De Novo Journal of Science in order to publish her paper. De Novo means from new, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's cool. right. I remember my university <laughs> stuff. Yay! <laughs> it's only been 10 years. <laughs> yeah. So this journal, and that is in very heavy inverted commas, was in fact a website which was registered just nine days before announcing her paper, and this was the only paper that was published. The paper itself is now to be found on the website of the Sasquatch Genome Project, which also includes documents giving responses from the reviewers who pointed out just how flawed the methods were. And the website also has pages that include unverified claims about Sasquatch people as a society, and a bunch of photos on a page named What They've Been Up To, which includes pictures of tree markings, signs, and gifts they have allegedly left. And in one section of this page on attempts at Sasquatch communication, there is a point which is just the word telepathy. <laughs> nothing more, nothing to explain that, but apparently they've been trying to communicate with telepathy. Interesting. I'm not, make, I'm not making this up. It sounds like I should be, but I'm not. You can... You can find it for yourself. You can handle just how bad the web design is on it. Mm. It looks very mid-2000s. <laughs> so that's pretty much all of the research into Sasquatch DNA available at the moment. While, while Jeff Meldrum is making a good effort at giving scientific credibility to Bigfoot research with this journal, the data sadly just isn't there to really support it at this point mm. in terms of DNA. And since Ketchum very much undermined the field a lot with unverified claims and attempts to get around the scientific process, that doesn't really help either. And the only analyses that have used sound methods in a past peer review, as I've said, found nothing. We obviously can't rule out that DNA of an unknown primate may be found in the future. But the evidence will have to be very strong in order to show a new species without a physical specimen. So I think that wraps up my section on Bigfoot DNA. So I will hand back to you, Charles, to round up the remaining Bigfoot evidence in the time we have. Yeah, so... I'm not sure if evidence is the correct word. I, I have a lot of theories to discuss, and I have some potential explanations that Bigfoot skeptics have proposed to uh, explain the multitude of Bigfoot sightings that have been reported over the last few decades. So before I do that, I also want to talk about a major argument that's often presented by Bigfoot advocates that purports to explain a potential origin for the Sasquatch. This is not a theory that is subscribed to by all Bigfoot advocates, and I'll discuss some of the more prominent individuals behind this theory shortly. So obviously, the major argument by Bigfoot advocates is that Bigfoot is simply an elusive form of North American primate that they hold is proven to exist from indirect evidence, such as the claim sightings, the documented footprints, and clips such as the Patterson-Gimlin film. Now, personally, I just don't think this hypothesis can be accepted in the absence of more compelling evidence, such as, as you suggested, Croft, the, at the end of your DNA discussion there, an actual body or living specimen of some type. I also feel, as we have chronicled here, that each major piece of claim Bigfoot evidence has enough concerns about its credibility that I don't think they can be accepted as unequivocal proof of such a creature's existence. There is a specific theory, though, that I do want to get into that has been argued by figures such as Bernard Huvelmans, John Green, and probably most strongly by Grover Krantz. And this is the theory that the modern Bigfoot 
is either a surviving population of an extinct great ape by the name of Gigantopithecus blackii, or blackie, or is in some way a descendant of this creature. Probably the biggest promoter of this theory historically was Grover Krantz, who promoted it throughout much of his career. And in 1985, he would even propose a taxonomic name for Bigfoot of Gigantopithecus canadensis. Uh, in an article entitled A Species Named from Footprints, his argument for this proposal was based around his analysis of the few Gigantopithecus fossils we have and claimed aspects of Bigfoot tracks. So, for some context, Gigantopithecus is an extinct ape, the remains of which have been found throughout southern China, that is currently estimated from both direct dating of the remains and faunal remains that have been found alongside its fossils to have existed between approximately 2 million and 300,000 years ago. So that would make it a rough contemporary, for example, of Homo erectus in the same region. So most of my information regarding this creature comes from the paper Gigantopithecus blacki, a giant ape from the Pleistocene of Asia revisited by uh, Yingxi Zhang and Terry Harrison. Currently, Gigantopithecus is only known from large numbers of fossilized teeth, along with four partial mandibles that in the past have allowed it to be reconstructed by various scientists as a large gorilla-like creature, standing approximately between 9 to 12 feet tall and ranging in weight between 180 to 300 kilograms. However, as the authors note, as the fossils of Gigantopithecus currently only consist of teeth and partial mandibles, it is extremely difficult to make any exact conclusions about the creature's size. And the current consensus amongst researchers is that it's more likely to be related to the modern orangutan than any other ape. Given the type of remains we currently possess, it's also difficult to tell whether this creature was bipedal as we lack any surviving cranial or postcranial remains. So we can't see, for example, how the creature's head would have rested on its spine, which is one of the determining factors in fossils for whether or not a creature was bipedal. So this presents something of an argument for anyone wishing to equate this creature with Bigfoot, which is claimed to be bipedal. Krantz himself was, however, more than happy to declare that Gigantopithecus is bipedal, based on just his own analysis, apparently, and to identify it with Bigfoot on the basis of claimed Sasquatch footprints, which, to me, is a curious claim, given that we don't have any known examples of Gigantopithecus footprints to compare them to. So you can probably tell that, personally, I think this whole theory is extremely far-fetched. Even assuming that Gigantopithecus was a bipedal creature, which as I've outlined, doesn't seem to be something we can assume. This theory would have required Gigantopithecus, which is a creature most likely adapted to live in the subtropical climates of Southeast Asia, to have migrated many thousands of miles across the temperate Bering Straits at some point prior to its extinction. This would have most likely have had to take place during a major glacial maximum, when a hypothetical Bering land bridge would have been formed. From here, it would then have been required to have survived in a much colder environment throughout the Pacific Northwest and been able to gather enough food to support a breeding population all the way through until the present day, some 300,000 years later at the least. And this population would presumably have been large enough that it would also have left some trace in the fossil record. So I know we detailed that Gigantopithecus fossils are somewhat rare in China itself but they do exist, fundamentally. However, there is absolutely no evidence in the North American fossil record associated with Gigantopithecus, or indeed any form of great ape. According to David Daigling, there are also a number of similar theories along these lines that have attempted to substitute in other creatures such as Homo erectus, and also a scaled-up version of an Australopithecine, which is a creature native to Africa, to the best of my understanding, and for both of which we again have no evidence in the fossil record in North America. 
Okay, so moving on from the Gigantopithecus theory, I would like to end today by briefly examining some of the potential explanations that have been proposed by Bigfoot skeptics to explain the vast majority of Bigfoot encounters. Obviously, in the course of our two episodes on this topic, we have covered the potential for hoaxing, uh, particularly for things such as claimed Bigfoot tracks and films. However, I don't think we've spoken much about possible explanations for actual Bigfoot sightings. Now, before I go into this in detail, I want to start by noting that even according to many Bigfoot advocates, these accounts do suffer from a number of problems. Whilst there are huge numbers of reports that have been made of Bigfoot sightings over the last few decades, they often vary wildly from one another. Uh, with people reporting Sasquatches with vast degrees of difficult physical attributes. According to a quote from Bigfoot researcher John Green, who historically has been one of the main compilers of historical Bigfoot sightings, people often report Bigfoot as being far taller than what has become the standard eight feet. So his exact quote is, from time to time, someone will claim to have seen something like a Sasquatch that was 10 feet tall, or 12, or 14, but everyone assumes they were mistaken. Now, as Daniel Loxton and Donald R. Profiro point out in their work Abomin Abominable Science, it does sound a bit rich that researchers would seek to exclude these sightings when they have the same degree of eyewitness support as creatures that are within the more regularly claimed height range. The response that they include in their work from Green essentially said people kind of have gravitated to the eight foot measurement simply as a height that they would expect from a monster, which is not the most scientific of reasoning. Also, according to John Green, other various attributes that have been reported associated with the Sasquatch include them having large pointed ears, as being many different colours, as possessing complex markings, and in some cases as being able to speak human languages. Green similarly notes that often these accounts are extremely vague or only partial, which limits any real ability to conduct meaningful statistical analysis. And finally, there's also just the simple factor that many of these sightings are also reported in connection with distinctly paranormal elements, which make it difficult to fit them into the mould of an actual living animal. Now, I personally don't think that there's any single explanation that covers all Bigfoot sightings, and I also accept that many of the people who report their sightings are sincere in what they believe they have seen. However, I do think there are a number of possibilities that might explain the vast majority of claimed Bigfoot sightings. So probably the most obvious of these possibilities is that some portion of these accounts are likely to have simply been made up by people uh, who may well be either deliberately attempting to get attention for their accounts or are simply amusing themselves by misleading a Bigfoot researcher. This is something that, again, is well acknowledged by many Bigfoot advocates. I don't think it's actually that controversial a statement. A second possibility, I think, is that many of the people who sincerely believe that they have seen a Sasquatch may have, in fact, simply misidentified another creature. So, a common claim that's made by Bigfoot skeptics is that a large number of sightings of Bigfoot are, in fact, just misidentified bears. The major argument made in favour of this is that many bear species can stand on their hind legs in specific circumstances, such as when they've been alarmed, when they need to reach something, or simply to get a better view of something. So the American black bear in particular has been observed to be capable of walking some distance on its hind legs, and it is possible to see how one of these could be mistaken for Bigfoot if it was encountered in the wild particularly if the observer's view was obscured. In support of this theory, Abominable Science cites a 2009 study in the Journal of Biogeography that's titled Predicting the Distribution of Sasquatch in Western North America by uh, Lozier et al. 
This paper compared 551 Bigfoot sightings that were compiled by the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization between 1944 and 2005 to the distributions of other large North American mammals, uh, including those of the American black bear Ursus americanus. The authors concluded from their investigation that the two distributions were generally a good match, although a point which is kind of goes unmentioned in, in Abominable Science is that the authors did admit that this paper was more of a tongue-in-cheek way to scrutinise the increasing use of what are termed ecological niche models in papers. So that is something to keep in mind. Obviously, I'm not particularly familiar with this particular type of analysis, but there didn't seem to be anything from the paper that indicated that the data itself was falsified. Outside of bears, there are many other possibilities. Outside of bears, it has been noted by people such as Daniel Daigling uh, and Daniel Loxton that there are other possibilities of creatures being mistaken for Bigfoot. In particular, any sighting of a creature at night perched up in the trees, such as an owl or a raccoon, could be potentially mistaken for a large creature. We should also admit that if Bigfoot is claimed to be a humanoid creature, it might very well be the case that some of these sightings were simply of people glimpsed in remote locations who chose not to identify themselves to the eyewitness. Uh, according to both David Daigling and Daniel Luxton, and I believe Grover Krantz, there are also many stories of people who have claimed to have seen Bigfoot, which later have turned out to be something as mundane as a tree stump that they mistook for Bigfoot after viewing from a distance. Indeed, Grover Krantz himself would actually admit many of the problems associated with these sorts of eyewitness reports, particularly in his book Bigfoot Sasquatch Evidence, on page 5 of which he says, With enough imagination, almost any object about the right size and shape can be seen as a Sasquatch. Similarly, it could be argued that many stories of Bigfoot being encountered on roads in remote forested locations could potentially be explained by someone only getting a fleeting glance of a more mundane animal before it disappeared back into the forest or otherwise out of view. And stories of people hearing Sasquatch vocalizations could well be explained by something similar, specifically people misidentifying the cries of other animals. So David Daigling gives an example of this in the introduction to his work that actually happened to him whilst he was out hiking in the Sierra Mountains with his brothers. Obviously, we are kind of trying to explain eyewitness, eyewitness reports with another eyewitness report here, so I understand if people have qualms with that. So according to Daigling, one night whilst he was out hiking around the campfire, the three of them were exchanging Bigfoot stories when they heard what is described as a plaintive wail, followed by a bellow of incredible volume. In response to this, Daigle himself sat there paralysed in fear at the unknown sound, whilst his other brother exclaimed, I am getting the hell out of here, and began shoving his possessions into his pack. However, any chance that they may have walked away from this encounter, thinking that they may have heard a Sasquatch, was quickly dispelled when Daigle's remaining brother got up went and got his flashlight from his pack, then went over to where the sound had come from and illuminated its source, which turned out to be an elk. Thirdly, I think there also is a possible category of Bigfoot sightings where people who are people who sincerely believe they have seen Bigfoot, but in reality just made some sort of mistake. So, Crofty, we both know that the human brain regularly makes mistakes and that the human memory is an extremely fallible one and can in fact be altered after the fact yeah in fact whenever you access a memory it is susceptible to being altered so an example that i've used before when talking about this is if a person were to see a car accident and allege that it was a black car in the accident but would be was later repeatedly told that everybody else had seen a blue car, their memory might over time alter to remember it as a blue car because they're repeatedly ac repeatedly accessing that memory. For context, folks, Crofty is a professional neuroscientist with big publications and everything. <laughs> yeah, I do science, me. 
for these sort of reasons, in both the wider scientific community and often in the legal system, eyewitness accounts are often considered to be extremely unreliable forms of, e of evidence. Hey folks, it's Charles here in post with uh, a little explanation of something. So when we were looking back at this section after recording the podcast, we basically came to the conclusion that we thought we needed to go a little bit more in depth into this and uh, look into some specific papers and references. So I've just gone ahead and recorded a small section talking about the reliability of eyewitness accounts. And that should be happening right now. So to give a few examples of studies that have examined uh, the reliability of the human memory, David Daigling cited a 1984 study in the journal Annual Review titled The Problem of Informant Accuracy, the Validity of Retrospective Data by Bernard et al. that concluded from a study of then available literature that roughly half of the information that was reported by eyewitnesses was incorrect in some way. Elsewhere, numerous papers published by Dr. Elizabeth Loftus and other experimental psychologists since the 1970s have demonstrated that eyewitness testimony can be somewhat malleable. And it is additionally claimed by the Innocence Project, a non-profit organisation committed to exonerating individuals that have been wrongly convicted, that of the 375 wrongful convictions it is overturned by post-conviction DNA evidence, 69% of these convictions were originally obtained due to eyewitness misidentification. Now, in fairness, according to some more recent studies that I found, this assumption that eyewitnesses might be highly unreliable, particularly in legal cases, that according to these papers has become something of an orthodoxy in modern psychology, this assumption may be somewhat overblown. So, for example, the study Rethinking the Reliability of Eyewitness Memory by Wickstead et al. from 2018 found that eyewitness memory could be reliable, but it had to be under correct testing procedures. Now, obviously I don't have the expertise to judge this claim, but what I did find interesting is that this study noted that what they considered the most reliable form of eyewitness testimony was the initial uncontaminated memory test. So, before the memory had been repeatedly accessed or possibly corrupted by the witness being given external information. To my mind, this could pose a problem for a lot of Bigfoot sightings, given that at this point, most people in North America probably have a number of preconceived notions as to what a Bigfoot sighting would involve, what the creature would appear like, for example. It's also the fact that when it comes to Bigfoot reports, there may be a significant period of time between a sighting taking place and it being recorded by a Bigfoot researcher. And so during that time, it's possible that the memory of the sighting could well have been repeatedly accessed. Okay, back to the main podcast. I think most people would understand that, Crofty, because like, you know, on a personal level, I think we've all had moments in our lives where we've seen something that was either kind of a quick glance or out of the corner of our eye, only to look back and discover that there was something other than what we initially thought it was, or that there just was nothing there, actually. So an example is, I, uh, it's not uncommon for me that I'll go out walking my dog along one of the trails near where I live, and I'll think that I've seen someone either ahead or behind me, but on second glance it turns out there was no one there and I was just alone on the trail. I think this is a reasonable mistake to make because you know, it's happening on a place where you would expect to encounter other people out walking their dogs, so your brain could very, mistakenly, could very well mistakenly insert figures into your peripheral vision. To my mind, I don't think it would be unreasonable for someone who had a similar experience regarding Bigfoot, especially if they are a Bigfoot believer or are in the sort of area where Bigfoot encounters have been reported by others that they could, instead of writing it off as just momentarily seeing something that wasn't there, they could conclude that they had, in fact, seen Bigfoot. So it is a very, a very common experience to have that sort of seeing something out of the corner of our eye and identifying it as something in the moment. Like, a common one for me is if I'm visiting my parents and reversing onto the driveway, I always think I've seen the cat and I'm about to run it over. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's never the cat. <laughs> She's smarter than that. I got a common one where I'm parking is I sometimes think I've seen a human figure in my peripheral vision and like I'll slam on the brakes and I'll look and there's not there's nothing there. Yeah. 
Okay, folks, so after what's probably going to end up to have been about six hours of final podcast lengths, that was Bigfoot. So, Crofty, at the end of this extremely long waffle, do you want to give us a update as to what might actually be happening with the podcast in the near future, particularly regarding yourself? Well, I'm going to be moving halfway around the world soon. I am getting deported from Wales. <laughs> I, I have mispronounced Lianva Pugungugoharequin Robuliante Siliogogok one too many times, and they're kicking me out for it. For those who don't remember me trying to pronounce Welsh before, that's the one thing I get vaguely close to correct. Mm. <laughs> that's, the, that's the joke, for those who don't yeah. get it. <laughs> yes, yeah, so they've decided to do the sensible thing, and they've kicked you out back to your native Japan. Yes, exactly. My, <laughs> my, my native Japan that I lived for 30-odd years before coming to Wales, <laughs> as, you can, as you can tell by my J- Japanese Yorkshire accent. Mm. So the result of all this is that Crofty, moving halfway across the world, takes up a lot of your time, doesn't it? It's a little on the stressful side, yeah. Yeah, especially if you're moving to take up a new job. So I thought it would be best if we just noted here that Crofty is going to be somewhat missing in action for probably either the next or even possibly the next two episodes of the podcast. He's not going to be gone forever, though. I think we're expecting you might be back somewhere around October, November time, if possible. That's the plan, all going well. Yeah. So in the meantime, it's looking like I might have a couple of possibly shorter episodes to help tide us over. One of them I'm going to be doing as a solo episode. And I've also successfully managed to line up uh, a guest for another episode. So you can expect to see those probably coming out in September and October of this year. Uh, So I guess I'm in the weird position here, Crofty, having actually give the hint for the next episode then. Yeah, I'm sorry to burden you with this. Mm, burden me with the responsibility of presenting my own podcast. Yeah. So Yeah, it's terrible. So the next episode is going to be taking place on a continent that we've only kind of briefly discussed before. We discussed it in the course of various dragon-based myths all the way back at the start of this podcast. We also discussed this continent in a peripheral fashion during the course of the Vampires episode. So this time, we're going to be focusing properly on a African story of myth, particularly a trickster figure coming to us from Northern Africa. So look forward to a discussion on that topic on our next episode. You missed Osiris for Africa. Indeed I did, but if I stay still and quiet, no one will notice. That works. Hmm. All right, folks, take care and uh, fare thee well, Crofty. Thank you and goodbye. (laughs) 